Mm-hmm. Okay. We are on air, mm-hmm. everybody. <laughs> All right. Oh, I got the notification. Good. Great. All right. Mm-hmm. Welcome, everyone. If you can hear me, let me know in the chat. If you can see me, let me know. If you can see Peter, if you can see Alexander, let us know. Let's start up, guys, because we have a lot to get to. Welcome, everybody, to a live stream, which will be covering the topic of Iran, Iraq, Soleimani, the United States, and no need to get into the news that's going on there. I'm sure everyone is plugged into it. Mm -hmm. Very controversial topic, and we've been getting feedback from all sides on on this story. And um, Peter, you sent me an email. You sent a message actually to me and an email to all of us the other day with an article via Craig Murray, which outlined the Bethlehem Doctrine. So let's start with that. But first, let me introduce everybody. We have (laughs) the host of RT's Crosstalk in Moscow, Mr. Peter Lavelle. Peter, how are you? Uh, Exhausted, but uh, what a way to start the year. Um, uh, We're going to be talking about this for a long time because this is a a story that's going to unfold in many different directions in many different ways. And it's uh, uh, it's, it's, a... it's a, a, a world historic event. Something has started and we have no idea where it's going to end. Mm-hmm. All right, great. Hello from Puerto Rico or Hampshire. All right, welcome everybody. And we have in London, mm-hmm. back from France, the Oracle of London, mm-hmm. Alexander Akers. Alexander, how are you? I'm very well. Uh, a little tired after a long drive, but invigorated from my stay in the Alps, which, however, was knocked aside by this news, which I have to say, um, I had not expected to be struck with at the start of the new year. I mean, 2020 has begun with a bang. And, you know, that's uh, not saying it, you know, nicely. I mean, this has been a a very disturbing and (laughs) ominous way of beginning a new year. Okay, so Peter, the Bethlehem Doctrine, Craig Craig Murray's article, International Law, Soleimani, we also have news yeah. that the Iraq parliament is asking the U.S. troops to leave. That's yeah. probably another yeah. legal issue that mm-hmm. we, yeah. we may mm-hmm. want to discuss here in this live stream. Mm-hmm. So, Peter, take it away. Well, just it, it kind of the, uh, uh, a thumbnail sketch here. I mean, the, David Bethlehem is a, uh, an analyst that came up with the idea of, mm-hmm. uh, uh, of pre, uh, preempt, preemptive um, uh, use of force. Uh, um, when, quote unquote, imminent threats exist. And what this does is, is it circumvents international law. Um, uh, Imminent threat, what does that mean? What is the timeline? Is it going to be a a few hours, a few days, a few years? How are you defining threat as well? This this was done uh, intentionally to be ambiguous for, uh, for uh, like the president of the United States to be able to make a claim. And if you, if you look at what Mike Pompeo said, he basically did uh, a Bethlehem doctrine um, um, uh, skit right there in front of everyone. He chose his words very, very carefully. And so um, the US is claiming that, it, uh, and this, was, this whole idea came into being, looking for a justification for uh, to go to war with Iraq in 2003. Okay, so this is the origins of it. And now it's being applied right now. Um, we're not given any information what those that, those threats were, what plans were being made. Um, um, no one in the administration wants to talk about that. Well, this is a seminal event. Uh, and I think the, the, the powers that be have to be more transparent because this has set off a train of uh, events, like I said a minute ago, that is, can go into many, many different directions. And um, are, are we prepared for that? And certainly it doesn't make the region any safer, regardless of the claims coming out of the administration and Mike Pompeo. So, I mean, instead of making the place safer, they're telling Americans they have to leave Iraq. Um, uh, and all through the region, they have uh, high security alerts, the highest, and more troops are being sent to the region. So, President Trump, what are you doing? This seems to be completely opposite of what you said you wanted to achieve. Now, we can talk in a, in a little later about uh, the whole situation with uh, the uh, Iraqi parliament, which basically the U.S. installed there after its illegal invasion. Mm-hmm. And now... Uh, Trump is threatening them, um, their de- democratic body. And, uh, and I checked, even though uh, uh, Kurds and, uh, and, and many Sunni uh, representatives didn't attend, there was a quorum 
there was a quorum. It is, it, it, and it's it's unclear how binding this resolution is. So, like, is the U.S. administration overreacting to it? Um, this has been a sovereign attack on Iraq, everyone. Okay, Iraq is the one that was attacked. And, and so um, Iraq is going to defend its uh, sovereignty. And so what is going to happen? The, the U.S. wants to have a, some kind of, um, um, I, don't want, I want to avoid the word war, but conflict with Iran and Iraq at the same time. How does that benefit Donald Trump in, in an election season? How does that, how does that further American foreign uh, um, uh, interests? It's very, very unclear. So, I mean, there's so many things we need to unpack here without... And I want to just finish my first stint here. No one on this on this podcast is pro Iran. OK, we're looking at the geopolitics of this. We're looking at how states view their interests and what they will do to further them. And it has nothing to do with liking or disliking Iran. I want to just put that to bed from uh, from the start. Great, because Alexander. I'm looking at the live stream and we got a lot of this in the comments. Mm -hmm. Quote, Iran went terrorist lovers, baffling how Russia supports Iran. OK, first. Let's dispel this. Russia, Iran mm. are the number one allies in the world myth. No, they're not. Number one. Let's get some some real history and some real facts here because everyone is spilling this out. Oh, the oh. Duran is is, mm. is backed by the Kremlin, and hence the Kremlin mm -hmm. is number one allies with the with Iran. So the Duran is is now Iran. well, you know, the, the, Iran the, the, fans. And the, and this and real quick, Peter, this calling us terrorist lovers is absolutely silly. We are just the opposite. We're against terror. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see more escalation of this here. What what Soleimani, why was he in Iraq? Okay, there's a lot of rumors and false fake news out there, but mm -hmm. from the best as I can tell. He was acting as an intermediary on behalf of Saudi uh, in, in, on behalf of a, a Saudi effort to to cool um, uh, the rhetoric between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It was a diplomatic mission more than anything else. Now we can we can take that apart because that's very very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why Salamani became came to prominence is because of foreign intervention into the Middle East and threats against Iran. That is a that is a uh, dispassionate way to describe what happened and why the, um, um, Soleimani was doing what he was doing. I'm not defending him, and I'm not defending mm -hmm. what he's done. That's not my position. What I'm saying is, who benefits from this? Where do we go from here? I don't see anything any upside here. Mm -hmm. Alexander. Go ahead, Alex. Well, I mean, let's start with Russia. I mean, Russia and Iran are not only not allies until very recently, they were not even friends. I mean, this is a fact that, again, people do not, I think, fully grasp. But the Russians have always been extremely concerned about I Iran's uh, uh, various programs. I mean, I, I, if Alex, if I could just jump in, remember, the United States was the great Satan. What was the second great Satan? Russia. Well, indeed, remember? Exactly. Absolutely. And of course, if you go back uh, not very far into Iranian and Russian history, there have been actual times when Russia and Iran have been enemies. They're not allies, they're not friends. They have a prickly and very difficult relationship with each other. Um, until a few years ago, Russia itself was applying sanctions on Iran. <laughs> this is a fact which, again, this is, you know, Mr. Putin's government. We're not talking about, you know, some other government. The Mr. Putin's government was applying United Nations sanctions on Iran, which Russia itself voted for because they were concerned about aspects of Iran's nuclear program. What the Russians do not want to see, and this is, I think, true not just of Russia, but of many countries. It's true of all of the US's European allies, first and foremost, who've been remarkably reticent in response to this. I mean, they've not you know, flooded out words of support for what the US has just done with this um, attack. What the Russians do not want and want to avoid is a conflict in the Middle East between the United States and Iran, which could escalate extremely dangerously in an area of the world, Central Asia, 
where the Russians have extremely important interests. There are many countries in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, all those, all the Stans that are very, very closely aligned with Russia. And the Russians do not want to see a major conflict between the US and Iran and their history the history of those conflicts, which the United States does launch in the Middle East, is not a good one. They've seen what happened in Libya. They saw what happened in Iraq. They've seen what's happened in Syria. They've seen how uh, uh, genuine terrorist movements, and I mean, you know, we want to define, we want to discuss this question of who is the terrorist very carefully, but they've seen these genuine terrorist movements, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and all of these movements proliferate in, this, in these regions as a direct consequence of those conflicts and interventions which the United States itself initiated. And they do not want to see the same happen in Iran. They do not want anything like that to happen with the Iranians. So the Russians, and in this, the Russians are acting within the overall global diplomatic consensus, are extremely concerned about this conflict situation that has developed. And of course, they are, uh, uh, they will look for ways if they can to calm it down. That does not make them allies of Iran. The only circumstance in which Russia and Iran might be pushed together is if the United States forces them together. And it won't just be the United States attacking Iran that you know, will bring Russia in. It will bring other countries as well. It'll bring China. It will bring the various Central Asian states. It will bring Turkey, which is, of course, a NATO ally of the United States, and which has made it very clear that it is strongly opposed to what yeah. has just happened. So, you know, let's, that's Russia aside. I'm just going to say something else, which is before we get onto the much bigger subject of terrorism, who is the terrorist and all that sort of thing. Uh, in relation to the Duran itself, I very strongly resent these claims that I sometimes see that we are in any way a Russian channel. We are not financed by the Russian government. We have no connection with the Russian state. We are three individuals uh, in three completely different countries. Alex is based in Cyprus. I am based in London, where I am a loyal servant of Her Majesty the Queen and a loyal subject thereof. And of course, Peter is in Russia, where he, uh, he, he runs a very effective independent program on RT. But we are in no sense uh, connected to Russia and we get no funding from Russia. And if anybody wants to you know, look us up in Cyprus, where all our books are transparent, they can see that for themselves. So can we please have no more of this nonsense? We are here to try and give what we see as objective analysis of what is going on. Some people may agree with us, others may not. That is their right. But please, no more of these ad hominem attacks. Just listen to what we say. Go away, think about what we say, and look at the situation in the Middle East. All the more important to do so at a time when the situation there is becoming so conflicted and where there is so much disinformation and propaganda spreading around. I just wanted to make those two points about you know, Russia and the Duran uh, so that we can now move on and discuss these very serious topics clearly and straightforwardly. And can I just say one quick thing, Alexander, me being in Cyprus, and as you know, you travel to Greece often, yeah. and Peter is also aware of this, the region that I am living in is being set on fire. It's not only Iran, mm. it's Libya, it's Turkey, it's Cyprus, mm. it's Greece. There's a lot of activity and movement and it's very, very dangerous times in the region as a whole. I just Thanks. want to preface that. So I'm living in this region mm. and everyone is really, really scared as to what's going on with Iran, with Iraq, with Libya, with Turkey, with Cyprus, with Greece, with Israel. 
There's a lot of tension here, a lot of tension. No, I'm, 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 I'm glad you brought that up because there's one thing that is so misleading in the media. And, and I think the administration is, is, is also a default that in, in regards to seeing whatever reaction there's going to be to this assassination, the, there's this assumption that it is uh, monolithically controlled by Tehran. That is a fundamental error to make. There's a lot of groups in the Middle East that look to Iran in a friendly way because they have common uh, adversaries. But if something happens in Yemen or something happens in Syria, these could be very, uh, very well be individual actors mm -hmm. that are, are, are reacting in sympathy um, uh, uh, against this assassination. And this put, uh, sets up a very dangerous situation because if, if something, if uh, 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 a it's say like a tanker um, and gets attacked. Um, there's going to be this assumption that it's Iran's fault, but maybe it's not. See, there are going to be plenty of people that want to see conflict. And I think there are people the surrounding Trump want this too. And we'll talk about how Trump benefits from this because I don't see how. I, I, I'm at a complete loss. I mean, November is coming up. All we needed to do was to just slide to November. There's no one in the Democratic Party that's going to challenge him. And, and, and beat him, he changes the calculus. He changes the calculus of his, of his campaign as well. So I see no, no win at all, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, but again, if you're saying that every single group that doesn't like the United States or, or Western occupation in the Middle East, they're all uh, uh, friends and controlled by Tehran. That is an error, a huge error. Mm -hmm. And we may see, uh, uh, based on these false assumptions, uh, rash actions that will create a chain reaction. We have said many times that um, the, the number there's been a number of war games uh, trials in Washington uh, about a, a potential conflict with uh, American Iran conflict. The U.S. doesn't never once comes out very well. Okay, hey, Iran can be easily destroyed. Yes, but does that mean winning? because the cost will be very, very high. So I'm very passionate about against, I'm against terrorism and I'm against these kind of conflicts. And then we're going down this path, which is very, very dangerous. And I'm very, and watching American media, most of these people don't have any a clue on what they're talking about, which makes it even more dangerous. Alexander, uh, we exchanged some messages the other day and we were talking about how this reminds us of WMDs in the Bush years. And we all lived through Mm -hmm. years and, and people may not forget because back then you didn't have social media mm -hmm. you didn't have all this technology and the smartphones but the rhetoric was just as charged yes you know the fog of war was 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 all over the mainstream media mm -hmm. and you know i remember the axis of evil and you know saddam hussein and and all these Bush, Rumsfeld, Cheney, all these and people the, talking and then, about. And this was the time also, I think it, it predates uh, social media, but the, this was the time with the run up to the war where blacklists were uh, made by the major networks yeah. and cable where you can't have these get, Phil, Don, Phil Donahue, remember him? One of the most prolific faces on American television. He was against the war. Poof, they disappeared him. MSNBC There's a lot, got rid of him. MSNBC, yeah. There's so many other people uh, they come, that are guests on my program. Um, that's when they, they, they lost their media presence be, and, and, the, and, the, and the powers that be have never forgiven them. All right. Uh, and, and some very prominent people, by the way. So, um, you know, I would much prefer to trust somebody like Robert Fisk that lives in the region, that knows the region, who's been writing about it for um, decades. Uh, you know, take a look at his opinion. Here's, that is, that's an informed opinion. But you, what you're saying, Alex, is right. They're just, the, the, the treadmill has been pulled out mm. and they're using the same rhetoric over and over again and people are falling for it. Yeah. And, and, and when has it worked out well? Mm. When has this rhetoric worked out well? I mean, mm. anybody in the chat, can you write a message to me and say, when has this worked out well for, and for whom? Alexander, any comments well, indeed. On, on that and WMDs and, and where we're moving to now? Well, indeed, this is exactly the same. I mean, it isn't just about Iraq. I mean, we saw this with Syria. We see this with this with the OPCW investigation, which has turned out to be horribly wrong. I, the fact of the matter is that you cannot just accept what certain talking heads in Washington and elsewhere 
tell you. You have got to look and examine the actual facts. You also got to listen to a range of different people who may be telling you completely different things. The most extraordinary thing about the WMD business in Iraq, the, the thing that has always for me stood out is that the one person who was actually telling the truth throughout that conflict about WMD, it turned out was Saddam Hussein. Now, Saddam Hussein was a brutal tyrant. I used to go to protests long before anybody in, you know, every, you know he became the enemy, the enemy of the day. I used to protest about the kind of things that he was up to. As a coordinator in my student union, I actually suppressed the student, the Iraqi Student Society at my university because I knew of the way it was being used by the Iraqi intelligence service to spy on Iraqi students within my university. But it was obvious to me at the time that it was Saddam Hussein, tyrant and dictator, though he unquestionably was, who was telling the truth. And the US government at that time was not telling the truth. And the fact is, we must not assume that simply because the US government says something, it is necessarily true. And that is the lesson we should have learned clearly from that conflict in Iraq. We've had so many other cases where it's been- Gaddafi, Gaddafi was saying Gaddafi, the truth, Alexander. He Gaddafi. warned about the migrants that everyone's now upset about. Well, he warned the world. Exactly. Well, exactly. And we remember all those stories about, you know, the Viagra tablets that weren't distributed, the people who were being machine gunned when they went to funerals who were never machine gunned, the African mercenaries who were carrying out these massive attacks who didn't exist. All of these stories about Gaddafi turned out to be false. And we see from the chaos that's now unfolding within the OPCW, that many of the stories we've been told about Syria have been false also. So please let us not just assume that something is true because people like Mike Pompeo tell us it is true. Let us look at what is actually going on on the ground, examine it as objectively as we can, as, we can, as factually as we can, and try to understand it. And if we do that, if we, if we stick to two basic principles, one, to get our views from a variety of different sources, and secondly, to go where due process and international law take us, and that's going to be the main subject, by the way, of this program, we can arrive at a fair conclusion to the truth. We saw reliable witnesses in Iraq, the weapons inspectors who were there, people like Hans Blix, who were telling us the truth. Scott people Ritter. Like Scott Ritter, whom I think you know, Peter. He was telling us the truth. And we also saw what international law was saying. And if we'd followed those two guides, we would never have had an Iraq war. We would never have had a, cha a, a chaos in Libya. We would never have had this ghastly war in Syria. And if we apply those principles to Iraq and to Iran, we will understand this conflict there better. And hopefully, if governments, Western governments, follow those principles too, we will avoid those same mistakes. Doesn't look very hopeful at the moment. And I'm sorry to say I agree with all the points Peter was making about this huge mistake that Donald Trump has made and how it will end up hurting him. You know, the, you know, the, 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 the strange thing, it's, it's not, it's, you know, the gray zone, it, they'll talk about this. Yeah. Um, and the if you go through the uh, uh, go to the main page of the American conservative website, um, we're essentially saying what they're saying. OK, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, irrespective of the bluster of what some people are writing about us, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Soleimani, he, he fought ISIS. Yeah. OK, that's what he did. And, and that's a good thing. And, and, and the, the U.S. and its allies directly and indirectly supported groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS in these countries. 
So when people want to throw around the world oh, the word terrorist, well, who is getting rid of terrorists? That's why Soleimani was so, is in, in, in death, uh, when he was alive and in death, so popular in Iraq because it was, it was uh, Soleimani and, and, and people around him that went after uh, uh, ISIS in Iraq. Remember that? That was only a few years ago when they were marching on Baghdad, remember? Iranian help was key. In, in getting rid of them uh, get, and pushing back the caliphate. Um, and, and give credit where credit's due in Syria as well. It was Iran, Russia, Hezbollah, and most importantly, the Syrian Arab army that is primarily um, a Sunni, by the way. His wife uh, uh, is, uh, is Sunni as well. So, I mean, you know, the, all of these narratives that have been fed to us over the years, they're just that. There's, there are stories that intentionally distort reality. Now, Soleimani, was he a great guy? I don't know. I know he, I know he fought ISIS. Um, and and that's, that's good enough for me. I'm not going to celebrate him. I'm just going to look at his, uh, an objective, his objective past. And that doesn't make me a sympathizer with, with uh, terrorists. Actually, just the opposite. Mm. All right. So before we get into the the legalities mm. and the international law part of this live stream, I'll say one final comment because I do have Peter Lavelle and Alexander Mercurius here. And this actually deals with Ukraine and what Alexander said. Guys, Peter Lavelle and Alexander Mercurius, go back and search all of Peter's shows. These guys were saying the truth about Ukraine as well. Mm. Did anyone listen? No. And today, 2020, what are we talking about in the United States? Talk about blowback. Talk about uh, collateral damage. Talk about unintended consequences. We're talking about a Ukraine gate, impeachment, coup of a United States president, all because Obama back in the day decided to overthrow the democratically elected government of Yanukovych. And Peter Lavelle and Alexander Merkurs did program after program. Peter did, pr I don't know how many programs you did on the subject, Peter, honestly. <laughs> yeah, you could speak to the, both of you guys. Mm -hmm. But you guys are saying the truth about what was going on in Ukraine. No one listened. Crimea mm -hmm. ascended into Russia. The country got torn apart in Ukraine. 15, 20,000 people died. We had the MH17 disaster. Things are spiraling out of control when people are not listening to level heads like Peter and Alexander. That's my final word on this before we get into the international mm -hmm. law part. You guys can chime in and then get into what's going on. With the yeah, but, wait, but, but what is really remarkable, and I'll, I'm going to obviously defer to Alexander and the curious when I, uh, on the legality part, mm -hmm. but what is really remarkable, you would think, you would think with so many more media uh, outlets and, and Twitter and Facebook and et cetera, you would think there would be much more debate, but actually it's, it is not the case. It's really odd to me because what, what it happens is that people are still accepting official lines, all right? And I mean, these, the, the, these um, um, Iraq papers that came, that got very little coverage. And of course, whoever, when it was coverage, it was uh, how those sneaky Iranians uh, undermine, undermined the United States in, in Iraq. Well, it, it was the Americans that undermined themselves. They were in, inept. They lied repeatedly over and over and over again about how the war was going. And of course, Iran is right next door. You have uh, Iraq is a Shia majority country and they have very strong fraternal relations. Way before even any borders were drawn, those people had commonalities. So what is really remarkable to me is that in this age of social media, you still have this, this, this fog where it, it, these narratives are generated by people like Ma, Ma, Mike Pompeo, which I don't, have no reason in the world to trust because he openly said when he was running the CIA that he lied, cheated, and stealed. He said that openly. So this is the sad thing is that when there's so much uh, uh, more of ability to get word, to get the word out, if there's still this muddle and, and, and it's, this is done intentionally. Mm. Alexander, you want to make any more comments or get into the international law, of, uh, into the international law part of what's going on in Iran? I think we should go straight into the international law, actually, because I, I think we've now covered all this, these points uh, uh, fairly well. I, I mean, 
we, we can look at the history and we can look at the politics, but um, I, I, I know Peter uh, and both I are time limited and the international legal issues are, are serious and they are important. And I come back to what I, I was saying. They are a good guide to actually understanding what has happened here and why this was a mistake. And can I just say something? I prefer always when talking about these kind of events to talk about a massive mistake, because as Talleyrand once famously said about something that you know Napoleon once did, Napoleon murdered a man, the Duc de Dongien, the pretender to the French throne. And Talleyrand said, it's worse than a crime, it is a mistake. And I think this is going to turn out to be a big mistake and a big mistake for Trump personally and a big mistake for the United States too. Can we remind, remind ourselves that was also true of Iraq? George Bush, George W. Bush, he had all kinds of people supporting him, people saying, you know, how clever and wise he was. Hillary Clinton was the same. Barack Obama with Ukraine, they're always for a short, Tony Blair, they were all for a short time heroes. And then it turned out that because they'd done this terrible mistake in each of those cases, their reputations were destroyed. Well, that's, that is such a really good point, because mm -hmm. the, for, for me, this is an unforced error. OK, yeah. Salomon, he's his um, replacement steps in immediately. Yeah. He had been with him uh, since 1998, I think it is. So leadership hasn't changed. No. So what did they what did they get from it, except for this a short moment of, uh, of, of glee? Um, you know, the the the. The, the, this moment, it's an emotional reaction. It's not a strategic, it wasn't a strategic decision made based on realities. And, and if you look at the history of warfare, you usually don't kill the leaders. Why? Mm. Because you need leaders to negotiate the end of the conflict. Mm. So this is anomalous in that sense as well. I mean, George W. Bush, um, uh, Barack Obama, they had Soleimani in, in their sights, but they didn't kill him because they knew that the, 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 the organization would continue, nothing changed. But this is, this is, this is great, but this is this emotional reaction to his, the, the, de the death of the, uh, the biggest terrorist in, in the world, that, that's what the, the mainstream media is saying. But you know, he's not looked at the, upon that way in Iran and certainly not in Iraq. And I think a lot of people, you know, we, there's this focus, you know, the US-Iran tension. Iraq is at the center all of this right now. Um, and if the Iraqis press the issue about American troops withdrawing, um, the, uh, the American footprint in Syria is put into question. And now you're going to have these neocons. They're going to go to the wall. They're going to, they, they're no way they want withdrawal. They want them to stay. And, and this is, this is the quandary that Trump has put himself into. And, 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 and there's no, you can't walk this back. You can't unring that bell. Mm. A, a chain of events have started right now, and I don't see a strategy. No. So, Alexander, the the question that I have here is: under what rules are we operating now yeah. in the world? Okay, because you, you have the the argument that Soleimani was the number he became the number one terrorist in yes. the world. That he yes. just killed yeah, tens of it, thousands but, of people. But nobody he, he did nine eleven. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Mike, like, Pence, Mike Pence, yeah. Right, Mike Pence is true, right. Yeah. But yeah. he was he was in Iraq on an official mm -hmm. state visit. Is that correct or not? Oh, absolutely. Let, let, let's actually. And, let's and he was and he was killed by yes. another state. Yeah. And that yeah. state has taken credit outright. Which yes. Get it to it. One hundred percent. What are the rules of the game now? Let's let's unpack this, actually. Let, let's just 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 take a step and look at what happened with this assassination. Uh, Soleimani, as we all accept, was a senior official of the Iranian government. He was actually a government official. He was involved in a diplomatic mission as the guest of the Iraqi government, which uh, was involved in trying to broker some kind of deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We know all of this because the Iraqi prime minister has confirmed it to us. Now, the Iraqi prime minister, you remember I was talking about reliable sources. This is a reliable source on this issue. We must 
assume that what the Iraqi prime minister tells us here is true. It has not been denied by the Saudis. Who are the people who would know? So the Iraqi prime minister tells us Soleimani comes to Iraq as the guest of the Iraqi government. He's due to meet the Iraqi prime minister on the very day he's killed, and he is killed whilst carrying out a diplomatic mission. So if we follow international law, three things begin to become immediately, immediately apparent. Firstly, he's killed on a diplomatic mission, and that is a major violation of international law. You do not kill people who are engaged in international diplomacy between accepted governments, whatever you may think about them. The second is, it is a violation of Iraqi national sovereignty. Iraq is supposed to be an ally of the United States, and uh, uh, you don't just kill somebody who is a guest of a government that you are friends with, or supposedly friends with. And thirdly, and this is where we come to this whole Bethlehem doctrine, the whole issue of our preemptive self-defense, he cannot have been on the brink of carrying out some kind of attack on the United States because he was engaged in a diplomatic mission, in a peace mission, if you will, between Saudi Arabia, his own country, Iran, and Iraq. Now, I have read Bethlehem's bizarre theories. <laughs> bizarre. I don't think anybody, uh, if I can say this for a fact, because uh, though I'm not an, in, I was never practiced in international law. I do know a few people who, who have. I can say for an absolute fact, nobody in the international lawyers community accept this. You simply cannot stretch any conception of preemptive self-defense to cover the circumstances of this killing. I mean, it simply can't be done. And killing somebody who is the guest of an allied government in the process of a diplomatic negotiation is about the worst type of murder. And I use that word very advisedly because this is the killing of a man, it's a murder, it's about the worst sort of murder you can make. And the Europeans have been very quiet about this. So interestingly have the Saudis, the great ally of the United States in this region. And why? Because through this killing, this very complicated negotiation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which the Saudis themselves initiated because they're trying to extricate themselves, themselves from, from Yemen. this conflict in Yemen, the Saudis have been put at a disadvantage by it. I've been reading all kinds of reports all over the place about how the Saudis are really pleased about this killing. No evidence of this has come to light. I very strongly doubt this. So in, if, you, if we apply simple principles of international law, this killing is clearly illegal and wrong. And that is why we see the reaction from the uh, US, uh, from, from the Iraqi government, the Iraqi parliament, and uh, um, also this quiet, this silence from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, the, 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 the bizarre, another bizarre thing is that it, it, with this um, um, summer, uh, summary murder, it, it, we're told this is a bargaining chip in a, in a, a future diplomatic parlay, which is very odd, okay? I mean, Obviously, Iran is going to react, and it will react when it wants to, how it wants to, where it wants to. It will be asymmetrical. Everybody that has been studying this knows this, okay? So it can come out of the blue. And in their mind, it will have to be proportional, which if you connect the dots, folks, that means somebody's going to get killed, mm. all right? And, and and so if, if this Beth Bethlehem do uh, doctrine can be used by one country, why can't it be used by another? See, that's, that is the dilemma right here. I mean, if, if this is going to be the justification, then why can't other countries use it as a justification? Or only one country can use it as a justification. See, it's very, very problematic.
because there's going to be a reaction. And everyone, and we already heard from Alexander Christopher, I mean, um, there's a lot of places in the world where they, there, there could be this um, uh, retaliation. And so everybody should be worried about that. And what is it going to do? Is it going to start a tit for tat? And then we get into a hot war? Whose interest does that serve? Mm. So, I mean, I, I just don't see the pragmatism in this mm. at all. I, I, mm. I can understand, you know, I mean, the, these uh, neocon talking heads, you know, they can be gleeful about the murder of this guy. Okay, fine. But wh how does it move the needle one way or the other, except for creating more tension? And it, pathetically, I mean, if you look at the very, very troubled relationship, um, non-relationship that Saudi Arabia has with Iran, and we have someone on a diplomatic mission to mm. sue, to calm the, the, the tensions, mm. uh, how can that not be a good thing? Mm. How can it not be a good thing? Mm. I, can, I, can I just give a, an example to just to clarify the importance of this, about the point about the diplomatic mission? If Soleimani had been in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of Iraqi militia base, in um, he, he traveled charter, he was on well, exactly, a charter plane exactly. If he'd been engaged in some kind of covert activity in Iraq, if he'd been involved in actual fighting in Iraq at the time when he was killed and had been, you know, commanding or advising some Iraqi militia group that was either attacking US troops or was, you know, about to attack US troops or something like that, in other words, if he had been in a conflict situation then you can argue in that kind of situation that perhaps killing him as part of you know the, the, the you know the, the 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 shooting of people from one side to another in that kind of situation that kind of death you could just about argue well, you could argue well, if, we, if, if, if the Iraq, if the Baghdad government had been informed that there was going to be a so a summary murder of a foreign national on your soil. Oh, on your soil. I mean, absolutely. But, but as I said, you know, if, if there'd be something like that going on, in a situation where this man is in a diplomatic mission, you don't do that sort of thing. Can I just give an example, a, a, a relevant example from U.S. history? U.S. history. In 1945, the U.S. government actually had talks in Switzerland with certain uh, with with an with an SS general Karl Wolf, who had been involved with Heinrich Himmler, and it was a time when uh, some elements within the Nazi government were trying to extend feelers to the United States. The U.S. listened to this man in Switzerland and basically sent him on this on his way. They said, "We are not interested in any kind of negotiation with you." They didn't kill him. They didn't arrest him, even though he was implicated in all kinds of things, because he was carrying out a diplomatic mission. People who carry out diplomatic missions have special protections. Soleimani was traveling, as Alex said, perfectly openly. He was traveling from Lebanon to Iraq on a commercial flight, no secrecy about what he was doing, no secrecy about why he was going to Iraq. The Iraqi government had apparently informed the United States about all of this. And yet, nonetheless, and despite that fact, the US went ahead and killed him. Now, that is extremely bad by any measure, by any measure that you apply in terms of international law. It violates Iraqi sovereignty. It violates the rights of diplomatic envoys. Now, as I said, as for Soleimani's uh, so-called you know, terroristic activities, as I have again said, as I said previously in another video we did, we are talking about a man, a special forces officer, a commander of special forces troops. He's engaged in many covert operations in Iraq and in the Middle East. To be straightforward about it, the US does the same. There were CIA officials in Pakistan in the 1980s organizing Afghan rebels who were carrying out the same kind of attacks on the Russian troops in Afghanistan at that time. 
Now, to what extent Soleimani was involved in those th sort of things, the targeted Americans, I don't know. I've seen some statistics about this. Of, uh, uh, it seems that out of, you know, the, if you look at the percentages, 83% of American casualties in Iraq after the US invasion of Iraq, which by the way, was also illegal, <laughs> 83% were carried out by Sunni militia, people that Soleimani was opposed to, and only 17% or around 600 men was carried out by Shia groups. And the extent to which those Shia groups were all operating under Soleimani's control is completely unknowable and unknown. And frankly, to my mind, extremely doubtful. I remember that period, that terrible period after the US invasion when Iraq was falling apart and there was violence all over the place. And what I remember about it, what I remember very clearly about it, was that the Iranians and the Americans at that time were both concerned about this very violent and very extreme Sunni insurgency that had flared up and of which Al-Qaeda managed to gain leadership and that the US and Iran were implicitly working together to try to contain it so as to stabilize the Shia government that was coming to power in Iraq at that time. So I doubt, frankly, that Soleimani himself would have wanted to kill Americans. I, you know, I'm not saying he didn't. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Or, but or Americans and, kill but, Iranians. They kill all kinds of people. And, but and, and also let, let's 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 keep the um, the lineage correct yeah. here. And I, and yeah. I'm glad that you're you're tempering this. I think it's really important. But um, again, you have these um, uh, militias uh, in uh, Iraq from the illegal invasion all the way to the present. Uh, it doesn't mean they're controlled by Iran. Maybe some are, maybe some individuals are, but that is not knowable. And you can't make that assumption. You can't make the assumption that uh, one man was calling uh, all the shots uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, give me evidence that that's true. I, I'm more than happy, okay, to have evidence. Because if you look at the cable stations, there's no evidence, except for you know, something that I've commented on with Alexander Christopher on a number of times. said, so thank God for Tucker Carlson. You know, they, after this happened, he devoted half his show, half his show, bringing on guests. Our favorite Douglas uh, uh, McGregor was on, uh, uh, people from the American Conservative. Alex Christopher, what was it, the, the, the gentleman's name from the American Conservative, oh, remember? God, I, I, and, I, I, I forgot, I forgot, it, but he it, made that one comment. We were talking and, about and, it. Antel, We're, I think it was. Yeah. And, yeah. He I said, forgot like, it, but he made that one comment at the end, and you may want to follow up on that comment, Peter, where he said, if Trump does escalate with Iran, his reelection chances are cooked. That, I think he actually used the word cooked. Cooked. Yeah. And then, and this is conservatives like like me. At least that, I'm con I'm concerned about it from that position. Not or, or wanting uh, good things or bad things to happen to any particular country. Okay. What again? This is an unforced error. We're going to all have to live with it. Mm. And for those big supporters of Donald Trump. You have to wonder why he did this when he's uh, gliding to victory in November. Um, it, it, Iraq wants American troops out. He should embrace it, mm. embrace it. They're doing him a favor. Yeah. This is what a good part of the electorate wants. Mm. This is an unforced error. Yes. And, 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 and the people that are surrounding him, they want him to get even more um, rigid and, and, and abandon everything that he's been hoping for uh, to, to re relieve America from the Middle East. Mm. The, the, when, when the U.S. leaves the Middle East, which it will, maybe not under this administration or the next, the, the region will have to finally come to terms with itself and it will resolve its issues. But as long as there's foreign engagement there, there's every reason in the world not to do it. And who pays for it? American lives, okay? Mm. American taxpayers, mm. veterans, and all of the costs that are associated with veterans after they leave the theater of war. And, we, and one of them is called suicide, mm. which is what, an epidemic for, for uh, veterans of these wars in the United States. It's not reported very much. 
Hmm. But it's an epidemic. I, I've read up to five to seven uh, former uh, military personnel commit suicide every day. Hmm. Okay, these are the costs I worry about, hmm. not just the political calculation. Alexander, um, Trump tweeted that he's not getting out of Iraq, hmm. or at least he's not going to get out unless the Iraqis, the, the Iranians actually pay him, pay the United States for the, the expenses of having the, the base. No, it's it, the Iraqis would have to. Is, is it the Iraqis? Iraqis? Okay, exactly. the Iraqis pay him for the expenses of, of building that fortress of the embassy and the base and everything that they have there. What, what do you make of that from well, a legal perspective, well, from a geopolitical perspective? I mean- Ludicrous. It's from a legal perspective, ludicrous. it's completely- and, and he also sent a tweet, by the way, Alexander, he also sent a tweet where he, he said that Congress was complaining that he was not notifying them hmm. of the steps he was taking. And he said, consider these tweets as a notification as yeah. to what I'm doing. So Alexander. Yeah, well, okay, let, let, let's, let's start with the, um, with the Iraqis and the Iraqis paying vast amounts of money and be threatened by sanctions if he doesn't, uh, uh, you know, if they don't pay these vast amounts of money. Iraq has granted basing facilities to the United States. It is entirely within its rights to withdraw those bases these basing facilities, if the United States persists in staying there, it ceases to be a guest of the Iraqi government. It becomes an illegal occupier. And as an illegal occupier, and this is a point which I think, you know, people need to understand, as an illegal occupier, occupying parts of Iraq by armed force, the Iraqis then have a um, legal recourse, right? A legal right to resist it, and they can resist it by force of arms. I, this is clearly understood under international law. And you know, Peter was talking about countries that might use this doctrine of preemptive self-defense. Why not Iraq? Why not Iran? If the United States starts pursuing these kinds of, uh, uh, um, you know, these kind of policies. After all, you can argue that these, e these tweets that Trump has been, you know, publishing about Iraq are themselves threats and they threaten a kind of force. Sanctions can be a type, you know, perceived as a type of force. The Iran as well. So, I mean, you know, this is not wise. Yeah, and, and the thing is too, is that it, it defies common sense. Oh, I mean, these these tweets threatening the Iraqi government and the, yeah. essentially Iraqi people it will only make the Iraq turn even more to yes. Iran. Yes. I mean, it, this is bizarre. Yeah. This is really bizarre. What and so if, if there's going to be threats there, then, then, then Iraq has um, legal recourse and it has a right to choose its friends. It has a right to choose its friends. And you know what? It, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't uh, choose its neighbors. Its neighbors are just simply there. Yes. You don't choose them. You have to coexist with them. And again, you know, as I put out on Facebook yesterday, I mean, not only does the United States um, want to uh, uh, ratchet up tensions with um, Iran, they're doing it with Iraq as well. I mean, how is that a winning proposition? I, it, someone explain it to me. Yeah. How is that a winning proposition? Well, indeed. And if we come back to the tweets, you know, that they are the, you know, they, they, they are the, they are the uh, report to Congress. Well, I mean, that is an admission, in effect, saying that those tweets which happen after the event are, 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 are disclosing this to Congress. They are an admission that he did not, in fact, consult Congress before he launched this attack, which, of course, incidentally, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on American constitutional law, but if somebody in the United States within the Democratic Party wanted to bring uh, grounds of impeachment on the grounds that he has violated Congress's powers to wage war, well, you know, I think they might actually have a possible case here. I'm not saying they're going to do that, but, you know, let's let's bear that in mind. My interpretation of these Trumpian tweets is that Donald Trump, deep down, senses that he's made a mistake. And I think so, too. Clustering I think so, is all yeah. about that. He was on holiday in Mar-a-Lago. He was bombarded 
by people like Pompeo, who's admittedly traveling all over the place, Lindsey Graham, all the usual crowd. They came, they said to him, you know, this, this man, Soleimani, who I suspect Donald Trump doesn't know very much about, is now in Baghdad. He is the he is the, you know, the arch mastermind of all our problems. This is our good opportunity to take him out. You know, this sort of awful language that's used about killing people. So Trump said, well, why not? And let's do it. And now I think as he sees the strength of the international and regional reaction, uh, uh, he's starting to have doubts. And of course, we know he listens to Tucker Carlson. <laughs> And we also know that uh, um, you know he keeps a feel for you know what many people within his base uh, think. So I think that this sort of blustering that we're seeing from Trump yeah. is a sign that he senses uh, at many levels because he's a clever man, despite what people say, that he was fooled into making a mistake. I'm going to just add one quick thing about this, which is that I also heard, and I tend to believe that what inclined Trump to authorize this was that he was also very put out and offended by the by the way in which he was criticized when he countermanded um, instructions for a strike on Iran after the Iranians shot down the Global Hawk drone that passed over Iranian airspace. So I think that, you know, they, they worked on him. They got him when he was isolated and on holiday and, you know, playing his golf and doing all the things which he's fully entitled as president of the United States to do. A man like that needs time off. God help us, we all need time off at times. And as I said, they came to him then, they, they fed him with all kinds of stories about how Soleimani was. I'm sure they did not explain to him why he was in Baghdad. They certainly didn't explain to him what the implications were. And I think he, he, he authorized it. And I think at some level he regrets it. And I think that's what his tweets are all about. It's never Trump's style to apologize or retreat. Yeah. He tends to double down. Usually that works for him. I think in this instance, it's making his situation worse. Yeah, and I, I think that Western audiences have to understand that Soleimani, what he was, how he was seen mm. uh, in Iraq and in uh, Iran. Mm. Um, you know, the government in, in, um, in Iran is facing a lot of, uh, of, of protests mm. because uh, uh, the economy is in very uh, in ba very bad shape for so many people, and there is criticism of the government. But Soleimani was not. He's considered a national hero. Uh, again, I wonder if that was explained to Donald Trump. Okay, and um, uh, the the important thing here is is that did they give him a strategy of how to What's the next step? Because they have they problem. I'm, I hope they said, Mr. President, they're going to retaliate after we we do this. OK, you have to understand that. And that we it could be quite devastating. So we have to be prepared. I wonder if they explained to him what could happen, um, because we're going to because we're waiting for it to happen now. And as I said earlier, it'll be of the time of Iran's choosing the time, place and how. And so that what is what has that done? It's ratcheted up uh, so much tension right now. And I agree with Alexander McCure. It's like it, not to um, explain what he and maybe deep down he feels it was a mistake. He will never admit it. That's just his. We know that's his style. Um, mm -hmm. But he's gonna he, he's gonna have to explain um, whatever the retaliation is going to be. And the longer it is, because it will happen. But the, the, it, it is. It, as long as Iran uh, waits and um, uh, deliberates on how it's going to react to this murder, Iraq is falling apart as we speak right now. And so Iran really has to do very, very little in a sense uh, to, uh, by just being a witness and watching Iraq fall apart. And, and it's a war of words now between the parliament in, uh, in uh, Iraq and, uh, and, and, and the Trump administration. The best thing for Iran to do right now is to sit on the sidelines and watch. Mm -hmm. And it will be to its advantage by doing nothing.
Do you guys think this is connected in any way to the impeachment and the fact that the papers are being withheld by Pelosi? Do you think some of the hawkish senators also approached Trump and said, look, these uh, impeachment papers, they're going to come to the Senate I, sooner or later. But, you know, we we need you to give us some something, something. Give us this Iran uh, thing. You know, I, I, I've been asked in the, uh, over the last few days about that. And, and, and is Trump did this as a distraction from uh, impeachment. No, I don't no, no, think not so. a distraction, not a distraction. I'm saying, Peter, say some of the hawkish senators say there's 15 votes that could impeach Trump in the Senate. Say some of the senators like Graham, like Rubio. I heard Rubio was also in the room. Mm. Rubio, these guys, Sass, who Tucker Carlson actually mentioned, these guys actually told Trump, look, Nancy is holding back those impeachment papers. We're going to support you, President Trump, in the impeachment, but you've got to give us something on foreign policy, something on Iran in order for us to go to bat for you. Is that viable? Or do you think I'm taking it too far? I'm saying this type of, dare I say the word, quid pro quo kind of arrangement. I wouldn't dismiss it, but my, my thinking is more along the lines with the, it's, there's such a bipartisan uh, view of foreign policy right now, and particularly of Iran. You know, it, it doesn't differ very much from Republican to Democrat. So I, 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 don't, I don't see any um, real strong connection here. Though the way you described it, it's quite compelling. Okay, I could see, you know, give us something uh, on foreign policy because Trump's foreign policy is rather chaotic to say the least, okay? Mm -hmm. but, and, and, and this is like a, to a huge talking point for these guys to go on the mm -hmm. campaign trail because they think it's actually a positive thing and they will continue to spin it as one until it really turns nasty. And then how are they gonna explain that? Um, mm -hmm. But this bipartisan negative attitude towards Iran, it's just baked in. That's a generational thing, and it goes across party lines. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the way you say it is quite compelling, but I, uh, uh, I, I tend to think that they saw this as uh, 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 their donors. The donors matter the most in elections, not the voters. And this was a, this, some donors would really like this. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and there's no downside for them because they just write a check. They, they're not going to get um, booted out of office and mm -hmm. you don't even really know who the donors are. So uh, I would look more at that angle. Right. Because Al Alexander, on that point, I mean, don't the neocons, the Democrats win because now they have another talking point to go mm -hmm. after Trump with. So Nancy Pelosi yeah, but, but that's like, a okay. But it's a procedural thing. They're not against right. the, the kill, but they say the way you did it. Right, exactly. That but that but it, gives them, it gives Nancy it gives something, them doesn't something, doesn't it? Right. But it's not, it's not compelling. It's okay, not compelling. But, but the neocons, don't the neocons win either way? The neocons don't care. Actually, the neocons probably prefer Trump out of office, to be honest. There's no doubt. I think there's no doubt about it that the Rubios and the Grams would rather see Trump go than stay. But either way, they get their Iran war. At least they get the opportunity for a false flag to now get their Iran war. In other words, the, the door's been cracked open and now any type of strike in the region, they can pin on Iran and they can ratchet up the war drums. I mean, don't the neocons kind you know, of that, get into this with the wind? That, that, that's really smart because there's no downside for them in doing it. The only Zero. downside is Donald Trump. <laughs> right. He gets, he gets he, they get all the upside, he gets all the downside. That's, yeah, I see your point. Yeah. What do you think, Alexander? Am I taking no, this I, too I, far? I was, gonna, I was going to say before, I, I actually think that there is something about uh, the impeachment in all of this. Not that Trump was looking to distract anybody, but I, I, I don't think Trump... No, Trump wants a trial. I yeah. think Trump wants, wants, I wants a trial. Wants to exactly. But Nancy's holding it back. But, but, I'm thinking Nancy's talking with Mitch, she's talking with Graham, all these guys, and they're saying, Nancy, just hold up a little bit. Yeah. Let's get the war machine moving. Yeah. But uh, exactly. I mean, the fact is, he does need Cruz and Rubio and Graham on side. Any president who faces impeachment is going to be uh, is going to be nervous and insecure. However, you know, strong his underlying underlying position may be, and there's no doubt at all. I think that if the neocons could get rid of Donald Trump and put Mike Pence in his place. They'd be delighted. They'd be absolutely overjoyed. Mike Pence is somebody who looks exactly like the kind of man 
who would start a conflict with Iran. And if they can get their war with yeah, Iran... Yeah, because, Ira- because the Iranians are behind 9-11. Well, <laughs> Did you see that? Did you see well, that? Well, of course I saw it. Uh, of course I saw it. I mean, it's both both ridiculous and, 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 and frankly scary that the Vice President of the United States is spreading that kind of nonsense. But anyway, but... You know, I, I, I do think that the impeachment has played a role. But I also think that Donald Trump probably didn't understand the full implications of what it was that he was ordering. I, you know, it's all very well. We've all heard over the last few days about General Soleimani. L- let's face it, he was not a household name in the United States a few days ago. Peter knew about him. I knew about him. We follow the news. We know about the Middle East. That's what we do. We spent hours poring over every report that comes out of there. We knew exactly what he was. I don't think Donald Trump, who is someone who is not especially well informed about the granular history of the Middle East in the way that we are, I'm not sure how much he knew about Soleimani, and that makes him very easy to manipulate in these kind of situations. Can I point out, we know that the CIA has manipulated Scripples. Donald Trump in the past. Scripples. Remember? Yeah, the, the dead ducks. ducks. The dead ducks. Uh, Alex, the dead ducks. Go ahead, Alexander, explain Scripple. the story. <laughs> yeah. that, that extraordinary case where, you know, they said, you know, that there were all these dead ducks and dead babies, and they got him to expel all those Russian diplomats, and there were no dead ducks and no babies no babies or children who'd been killed, poisoned. So we know this kind of thing happens. And I suspect something like this happened happened again. And the fact, as I said, that he was impeached, he's being impeached, and that he needs the support of all these key senators who are arch hawks and you know, war hawks and neocons, I think that must have played a certain role. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it, it's obviously it's on his mind. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this it, it, people will say Trump did this as a distraction. But what's going to end up being and this could end up distracting Donald Trump um, uh, over the next over the next few months. And that, is that really something he wanted to um, uh, throw into the mix? Uh, I, I tend to doubt it um, when things are going well. It's the old adage. If it's not broken, why fix it? OK. And I think that, you know, some China has been uh, broken and uh, he's going to have to deal with the consequences because he is the commander in chief. It's under his watch. Um, I, I can't believe it was his idea. As Alexander McCure has rightfully said, I think they convinced him that it was a, a good idea. And it was a good idea for them. And he gets all the risk. Yeah, I mean, looking at uh, Trump's press conference where he was talking about the, the killing of Soleimani. Not he looked, the best. He looked he rattled. Looked- he looked, he Pompeo, looked, on the other hand, was giddy. He was going on all the channels and, and you could tell he was excited. So it was interesting to watch. The, 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 yeah, the, the, that metric is very interesting. I saw it too. It was something, it wasn't uh, very Trumpian uh, his, his, because he's, he's, he's on a roll right now. He's on, the, I mean, at least the macro indicators are all on his side, jobs and all this kind of thing. Uh, he's getting things done. Uh, slowly but surely, he's getting his judges ap- appointed. I mean, he's things are going pretty well. Mm-hmm. And when he was, and I look at some of his rallies, I mean, he enjoys it. He knows he's mm-hmm. winning, but that that presser was very strange. It was yes. very unlike him. At least that's my read. I agree. I completely agree. I entirely agree. By the way, I think you know, if he'd been in Washington, if he'd been in the White House, if he'd had his aides and all the information there, I think he would quite likely have said no to this attack. If he was in the White House, sorry, if he'd been if he in was the in the White, White House, House, you said, yeah, yes, if he'd been in the White House instead of Mar-a-Lago, if his mind had been properly focused on all of this, he would probably have said no. And if he'd said no, precisely because he is on a roll people like Graham and Rubio and Cruz would still have supported him in the Senate in the impeachment. But as I said, he was isolated. They got him at a moment when, you know, he wasn't, his mind wasn't fully engaged on all of this. I am sure they didn't, they didn't advise him and inform him properly. And there we, and now we see the result and we see his reaction. And I, I agree completely with the point 
that he does he didn't look comfortable about this. Whereas Pom uh, Pompeo, he looks exalted. I mean, he looks frankly intoxicated. About well, it. and this and this may be his final hurrah as mm. as uh, sec Secretary of mm. State because right. we. It's it's the big, biggest open secret in Washington. He wants to run for the Senate, yeah. uh, and uh, and he wants this is one of his uh, talking points. Yeah. And uh, and so again, uh, Pompeo, there's no downside. He won't have to deal with it. I'll tell you who will have to deal with this. It'll be um, Lavrov, Sergei yes. Lavrov. He's oh, yeah. the one that's going to get stuck with this again, again. Where they're going to need they're going to need someone of his uh, uh, caliber. To say, look, everybody take a breath. Everybody take a breath. We everybody has something to lose now. There's no way. There's no reason to go further. I wouldn't be surprised, and I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be surprised if it's already being talked about behind closed doors. Well, Peter, can I just say? I mean, I haven't checked this morning, but already yesterday he was talking. To, uh, Lavrov was talking to the Turkish foreign minister about this very issue, and I'm sure he's the phone lines from Moscow to Tehran. And from Moscow to Riyadh are all buzzing, and I'm sure the Russians are at work again. And yeah, and I'm not surprised because no, uh, not Turkey surprised. has a it doesn't Absolutely. have the same view about exactly. Iran as the other NATO exactly. countries. Exactly, but you're quite right, Peter. It's always the Russians who are left to pick up the pieces. This is not a pro-Russian statement; it's a statement of fact. Look at what's happened in the Middle East, or ultimately, it's always the Russians who have to come in and sort out the mess. Yeah, and 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 and, and, yep. the, and the and the fact and again just kind of reinforce the importance of the, the telephone call um, uh, uh, to uh, Lavrov's Turkish counterpart is that Tur Turkey doesn't want to have have anything to do with this at all. Okay. They don't. They're not. They don't want their airfields to be used no. um, against the RAM. They're going to say no way. You you want no. to do your war operations or not? And, and that that's why Turkey is such an important NATO member. It's location. It's geography. And it doesn't want to get pulled into this at all. And uh, if, if, there, if this escalation continues, uh, obviously NATO may play a, a fig leaf role and Turkey is going to say, uh-uh, we're not going to play. All right. Any more comments before we get to the Super Chats, guys? No, not for me. <laughs> but uh, there's lots, lots, lots to keep an eye on here. But, so let, let, let's see what... Yeah, well, quite a few Super Chats to get to, so... Let's get started. From Amber, how is Greece involved in the conflict? Greece is not, not directly in the Iran Iraq conflict. Go ahead, Alexander. Yeah, he's not directly involved. The area. But as as Alex absolutely rightly says, we are we Greece, which I am also a citizen, by the way, of Greece, as I am a Briton. Greece is directly thrown into this region. I mean, Greece, uh, uh, Cyprus has just finalized a major deal. Uh, you know, on the gas with uh, with Israel and, uh, all, you know, all of these countries are coming together. Now we see chaos in the Eastern Mediterranean in a territory very, very close to us. And we, the Greeks who do not have massive amount of diplomatic leverage are extremely concerned. I can remember how during the Iraq war, the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, where the, you know, US aircraft were flying or from Greece, and uh, um, the massive amount of you know electronic jamming that was going on actually affected communications in Greece itself. So you know this has huge implications for us, and if there's a mass movement of refugees because there's a major war in the Middle East, we are right on the front line. I was talking only the other day to people who are not, by the way, Greeks, about, you know, who, who, who witnessed what was happening at the refugee camp in Samos. I know all about people, you know, who were involved in the refugee camps in Athens. And from our point of view, from the Greek point of view, if there's, you know, chaos in the Middle East, our, our, our economy is damaged, and we're right on the front line if you know th uh, uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or god help us even millions of people are starting to flee towards europe from a conflict zone so you know we are people in greece are very concerned so, uh, alex you may have things to add i just want to add the tensions in libya and yeah. and you know turkey is now erdogan actually has announced that he is moving troops into libya as well yeah. and so you know in one conflict in iran and iraq could easily pull in and suck in yeah you know, another conflict, which is 
brewing up in Libya, which I think could be a whole different live stream that we do as to what's going on in Libya as well. So, you know, the, the point there is that the region is very volatile right now. Very volatile. Yeah, and, and, and if, um, with the, going back to um, um, the Iraqi parliament um, a passing, a non-binding, let's be very careful here, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, it's more rhetoric at this point because there wasn't a timeline attached to it, no. okay? This is, a, this is a political statement. It's not a legal one right? at this point anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I want to stress again, there was a quorum, okay? So the, 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 it's functioning the way it was designed. Mm -hmm. But um, if with the uh, a question mark over American troops in Iraq there, um, who's to say that, you know, Trump might uh, be convinced to double down on uh, increasing troops into Syria, okay? And, and because we had, remember we, with the first, um, um, the downgrading of the number of troops, they, where did they, in Syria, where did they go? They went to Iraq. Mm. Okay, now the U.S. is going to be more obviously working on a contingency plan, which, of course, impacts um, the, the slow um, renormalization of, uh, of Syria after this horrific international proxy war. So uh, uh, Syria has to be very worried about this, too. After all mm. the progress has been made in destroying the caliphate, um, you're going to give uh, members that, uh, that were, once were or, or were even intending to become part of, of that. So, it, the, you know, the, the, again, this this upsets the, the chessboard. I mean, when with uh, the, the caliphate and ISIS uh, all but destroyed, now they're given a reason to come back. OK, again, the uh, law of unintended consequences is at play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the refugee issue, like Alexander oh, said, Erdogan huge, just the other huge. day said in Idlib that there's 250,000 people that he's holding back from flooding into Europe. I mean, Erdogan made that statement as to what's just happening in Idlib. If, if this thing explodes in Libya, mm. in Iran, in Iraq, how is Europe going to deal with the flood of refugees? In my case, it, it'll crack. Absolutely. It'll completely collapse. Yes. All right. All right. From Brave New Perth, the American empire is on a suicide mission for world domination, regime change in Iran and Syria with the help of Israel and Saudi Arabia? Well, I mean, the, 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 what's happening here is that there is a huge paradigm shift occurring and mm. the unipolar moment of these neocons so adore, mm. it's coming to an end. The window is closing. And that's why you were getting this very rash reaction um, because the, the status quo is changing and everyone has to adapt to it. Um, American presence in the Middle East is not welcomed. Okay, you have you do have elite capture and all of that. I, I understand that, but it's 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 long overdue for for uh, for the U.S. to withdraw and it has to recalibrate because, mm -hmm. as I said the last time we did a live, the Middle East is turning into a strategic backwater, mm -hmm. and this, why deploying all of those resources for negative returns? Okay, that's what this is really all about. Mm -hmm. of, of course, of course, you know, and when you when you leave, someone is going to call it a retreat and it's, uh, it'll happen on your watch and all of that. You know, that's why we need to have good leaders. Good leaders can say, no, this is to our advantage, not our disadvantage. OK, and it actually can help our allies because, you know what, these people are going to have to sit down at, a, at a one big peace table and talk mm -hmm. for the last few decades. That has not happened because of foreign intervention and presence in the Middle East. And if the Iraqi people through their parliament want to uh, have uh, uh, foreign troops um, leave, they sh the, the, the foreign troops and, and the US should honor that. I mean, isn't rule, aren't we supposed to be living in a rule-based environment? So, you know, the, this is the, the consequences of strategic overreach and it's time to recalibrate. And, and, and no one really, too many people make too much money and careers and all of that. You know, they, they, you know, they, they used to, you know, too many people are addicted to, to um, uh, the status quo. I mean, and, and when you look at, you know, like the arms trade and stuff like that, that's very, very lucrative. And it's lucrative for a small number of people. And they don't want that to change. All right. Flying boar. Things have escalated and lines have been crossed now. Trump just threatened Iran again. And if I'm Russian, they should put S-400s in Iran. Well, I, 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 but I, Iran I, hasn't even requested them. Exactly. Okay? They I don't think. Them. I don't think the. I, can I just say something about? Firstly, I don't think the Russians would welcome that kind of request at all. They certainly do not want to get into a conflict between 
um, Iran and its various enemies. Well, and why? And why? Which we have to clarify why they probably wouldn't do it, because yeah. from the Russian side, that would be seen as escalating. They exactly. want de-escalation, exactly. not exactly. escalation. Exactly. Okay, and, go ahead. Yeah, and what I just wanted to say, the Iranians not only have, they, they haven't requested it because the Iranians prize their independence from Russia very, very strongly. And they will not want to become too dependent on, on, on the Russians either. My impression, by the way, is that in military terms, the Iranians know perfectly well that they cannot defeat the United States in any war outside their own territory. But I think that they are fairly confident that they can defend themselves within their own, or at least inflict so much damage on the United right. States if it attacks them. That and, that it's a, and its allies. Exactly. And its allies. Exactly. That, that, that it will deter the US from doing so. Now, I am not a judge of these things. I'm not able to say whether these calculations are right or wrong. I simply say that is what I think the Iranians think. Okay, super chat from Flying Board. Diplomacy means nothing to the West. It's meaningless. Well, this is what we've just seen. I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't. One must be careful not to talk about, you know, the entirety of the West. But if you are talking about the neocons, yes, they do not believe in diplomacy. They believe in dictation. They believe that the exceptional power, the country that sees further and knows more than every uh, everyone else, hands out its orders and everyone else obeys. And the result. It's what Peter said, the, multi, you know, the unipolar moment that they were so prized with is disappearing because countries like China and Russia and, dare we say it, Iran and Turkey also and all sorts of other places will not be dictated to. And they're now taking steps to ensure that the U.S. cannot dictate to them. And that is what is ending this moment, this period of time when the United States seem to have this extraordinary freedom of action and where it had, you know, world leadership within its grasp. And one of the interesting things, too, is that um, because Iran um, refuses to come to heel, it, it sends a message out to the world that you can say no. You mm. can say no, even though it's painful. Mm. And and. You never hear. We've talked a lot here about international law. When you when you watch cable news, particularly in the United States, with very few exceptions, international law is never mentioned. No. That is not the 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 the, the rubric that they un, they 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 operate under. They, no. they from Fox all the way to CNN, they're they're exceptionalists. They believe in exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And, that, and, 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 be, and when you believe in exceptionalism, you have no need for international law. As a matter of fact, international law is an impediment. Mm. You know, and, 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 you know, John Bolton is the poster child for that. OK, yeah. but we all know Bolton's gone, but Boltonism is, is strongly remains. Absolutely. So real quick, tearing up the JCPOA and now this, what what, what does this mean for how people view the United States. And the well, you can't make an agreement. You can't make an agreement. States. You yeah. can't make an agreement. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm loath to say this, but the nuclear deal with Iran under um, uh, Barack Obama was a good idea, and mm. it should have been a stepping stone for a regional security pact that mm. was in there was was in our grasp. And walking away from that deal was a terrible mistake. Yeah. It still is. Yes. Yeah. OK, uh, it, and it, oh, why? Because it, it's it's against, it's against proliferation of, of these awful, horrible weapons. And it could have been and should have been a standard bearer for, for um, disarmament around the world, including the United States, including Russia, including China. It could have been a stepping stone. And it, 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 it's, it's turned into this the opposite. Uh, you know, we, have I, so, we have so few arms control agreements now really? and they're fading away. That's dangerous. Well, I, I, I completely agree with that. And can I just say something? I mean, I, I, you know, one, I know that there are many people who have different views about climate change. I, I am not somebody who has the knowledge of this. But what I do think is much more urgently dangerous at the moment is the collapse 
of the arms control system that Peter was talking about. So we see the JCPOA going. We see the ABM treaty. All that went back in 2000, was it three or four? Anyway, a long time ago, the INF treaty is gone. The Open Sky Treaty, Open Skies Treaty is apparently on its last legs. There's no talk about uh, pushing ahead with the, you know, the START treaty or, or, or extending the START treaty. Now we're talking about the United States responding to Russian hypersonic missile developments by developing once again you know, space-based interceptors and the militarization of space. It seems to me that this is all incredibly dangerous and far more immediately dangerous than climate change. I have to say that because it seems to me obvious and true. And it again concerns me that so little is being said about this. We're worrying about, you know, the death of Soleimani and so we should... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's it, part it, of again, we'll a general it. deterioration in an overall international environment with international law being flouted and disregarded and arms control going up, you know, going up the spout. You know, the, the, the people just forget history or never learn it, is yeah. that the, the United States and the Soviet Union were uh, for, what, for 50 years were locked into a Cold War. And they were they were they saw each other as, as enemies. OK, mm -hmm. they were very careful not to kill one another. They used yeah. proxies. OK, mm -hmm. but they had agreements. They sat at a table. They shook hands. Mm -hmm. They signed agreements. OK, yeah. and, and that was against evil communism. Right. An evil Soviet Union. OK, mm -hmm. but you can't do it with Iran, but you could do it with the Soviet Union. Really? OK, why? OK, there's this I, I think what was it? The. Uh, our last podcast, I said, you know, people have to start reimagining the world, reimagine it. And this, these people in power cannot reimagine the world. No. And, and that is much to our uh, uh, detriment and danger. Yeah. All right. Sorry, guys, just uh, removing some trolls. <laughs> All right. From Imre Kalman, Super Chat, does the, does the U.S. recognize the ICC? The no. International Criminal Court. Yes, it, it's not part of it. It's it, not part of it. it insists yeah. that the ICC has no jurisdiction over it. So uh, this is the International Criminal Court. Um, it, it, it's it's essentially opted out of that whole system entirely, uh, and uh, and but but, uh, but, they, but, but, they, but they like its existence because they want uh, people to be yeah. sent there, just not their own. Okay? Exactly. Well, exactly. Look at like, Milosevic, for example. Exactly. Okay. And so the U.S. doesn't recognize it, no. uh, but it likes what it does. Okay, exactly. I mean, get well, your provided head it that, controls okay? it, You're provided right. it control is able to control it and direct what it does. I mean, nearly everybody who's been prosecuted by the ICC or, or convicted by the ICC here so far has been African, apparently. I mean, it's been it, it's avoided going under against any of the nationals of any of the big. Of, of any of the big powers and realistically it's not going to go after the u.s anyway not in any uh, immediate term well tony blair um, belongs there <laughs> oh, <boy>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly from pad sexual shovel five dollar super chat the left's hypocrisy is laughable they said nothing during bush and obama and trump would have been called a putin puppet if he helped iran fight isis mm. Very, very possible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, this yeah. is uh, in, in, in the biggest picture of it all here is that mm. Iran was was and remains at war with terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS. Yeah. And that doesn't get any coverage at all. Yes. OK, you get Mike Pence saying, you know, Iran's connected to 9-11. I mean, yeah. even if you look at the 9-11 report, as bad as it was, it, it didn't draw any of those conclusions. Yeah. Where does he get this? OK, no. he still was spinning spouting? lots of propaganda. He was really? spinning lots of propaganda. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's interesting, actually, because that that point, in fact, what we know from the sort of Russiagate investigations is that there were preliminary talks between uh, uh, people within the Trump team and uh, uh, the Russians about setting up some kind of alliance by the US and Russia to fight 
Islamic terrorists together. And the Russians were very receptive to this idea. Right? They were keen on it. They, they, still, the they, still, they, still, they still trade still do. information. They still, they still do. do. They, still, they still, do. still do. But all of those, all those meetings, and this is, this is what the famous, you know, Kislyak, Kushner, Kislyak, Flynn conversations were primarily all about. All those conversations were then interpreted to prove <laughs> that you know, there was this secret back channel going on between the Russians and, and, and Trump, and that the Russians were using the back channel to somehow control Trump, and that the back channel was being used to, you know- Every, 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 pre Trump. every president during the, uh, yeah. um, uh, 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 in the post-war era, um, whether it was the Soviet Union or Russia, mm -hmm. always had back channels. It's nothing it's new. Nothing. Exactly. Nothing, it's actually the norm. Exactly. But as, as, as a result of all of that, that, that possibility of creating a Russian-US alliance against Islam, Islamic terrorism, is that, you know, jihadi terrorism, all these awful groups, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and all the rest, that was lost. And it's a great shame, actually, because had the Russians and the Americans worked together to fight ISIS and Al-Qaeda, firstly, it would have ended those groups far more quickly. I mean, Al-Qaeda is still there, we mustn't forget that. ISIS is still there in remnants, but it's still there too. But it would have also worked, I think, to stabilize the region as a whole, because with the Russians and the Americans working together, they would have talked to each other, there would have been a bigger range of ideas circulating. But it didn't happen. The neocons were against it, and the Democrats uh, abused it and misused it as they could. So, Sp spineless, you know, yeah, spineless, spineless for, for, for very, very um, cheap um, uh, um, political gain, you know, That's without any kind of uh, uh, foresight whatsoever. I mean, exactly. th this whole Russiagate thing is just such a farce. It will go down in history as such. Exactly. Okay, from Brave New Perth, how will China, Russia, NATO, and Turkey respond? The Chinese and the Russians have made it very clear that they're horrified by what has just happened. Uh, and they will do what Peter said. They will try and find ways to calm the situation down. Turkey has announced that it's basically backing uh, 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 Iran. And I think Peter's absolutely right. If there is a war between Iran and the US, the US is not using Turkish bases to wage it. I think that's <laughs> you know, I, I just have to, you know, I'm just imagining, you know, here, the, the, the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party is meeting mm. right now and they're reading the Western press and they're saying, what? Oh, no. Another war in the Middle oh, East? No. Another one? Oh, no. They're going to waste all their resources again? Again. I mean, again. Again. I mean, I mean, I mean it, it must be almost tragic comedy from their point of yeah. view. Because it, it look, you know, from... 2003, all the way to the present. How has China changed? China has just moved leaps forward in every respect. And the United States continues to allow itself intentionally, willfully to be bogged down in the strategic backwater. Exactly. They, yeah. they must think the, the Americans are nuts. Well, exactly. Really. Can you guys go into a little bit of NATO and more specifically Europe, what they might well, do in uh, response? Because during the WMDs, you had to remember France resisted and remember you had instead of French fries, you had freedom fries. Remember all of that going down with France when they resisted, you know, the WMD's narrative. Lib during Libya, you had the UK and France participate in dismantling Libya. So what do you think the dynamics are going to be well, well, if this thing escalates? If this thing escalates, the Europeans are so weak now and their political leadership is so poor that I don't think they're going to do very much in any form. But I agree. I agree. you're talking about the French. It's perhaps interesting that Macron, who is just about the only uh, European politician who has any kind of, well, I won't say strength of character or imagination, but at least ambition. Uh, he telephoned the Iraqi prime minister and said that France supports Iraqi national sovereignty, which some people, I think, correctly are seen as a kind of veiled rebuke over the U.S. Uh, against the U.S. I can remember Margaret Thatcher when, you know, Ronald Reagan invaded uh, that Caribbean island, Grenada, mm -hmm. talking strongly out, speaking strongly out against it. 
you don't you won't see that from the Europeans this time. I think the Europeans are going to sit this out. I think they're, they, I mean, they, I they have won't to just go a moment. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think that they're going to get actively involved in it. I mean, this is Trump's show. Let him have it. OK. And um, because and they, there's too, it, there's a lot of downsides. We've already mentioned it here. Plus, they do have business uh, contacts with Iran and they're the ones that uh, end up being uh, um, um, on the receiving end, if there's going to be any kind of uh, huge migration, it's Europe will be the, the destination uh, that where these people will go. So I don't see the Europeans particularly uh, uh, wanting to get involved in this. But, you know, uh, because they're members of NATO, they, they can have their arms uh, twisted. But uh, it, that would just be more for uh, as a fig leaf. I don't, I don't think any real uh, um, um, manpower material, it'll just be uh, rhetorical more than anything else. All right. From Momo Momo Super Chat, just a, a gif of a, of a bird giving a thumbs up. <laughs> so thank you for that Super Chat. From Clara Whalen Super Chat, Australian $72. Thank you very much, Clara, for that Super Chat. From Vlad Drak, five pound Super Chat. Excellent analysis as always, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad, for that. From Acid Jazz, a 10 Swiss franc, I believe, Super Chat. What about, what about RT retweet spread of Wahhabism was done at the request of West during Cold War, Saudi Crown Prince MBS said. This seems to be an old topic for the U.S. Well, I mean, it, it, where did the, the, the Mujahideen come from? OK, I mean, that, I, I date myself, but I mean, this was a radical Islamic um, uh, jihadist group. And um, they were in the service of the West uh, when, when the Soviet Union was in uh, Afghanistan. I mean, there's a long history of this, a whole a very long history of it. And then you have all of these proxies. They want to call them free, freedom fighters. But I mean, look what they did to, to Syria, um, mm -hmm. supporting, you know, the 31 flavors of jihadism. Uh, so, again, you know, the, it, it, for people that are informed, you know, you can dislike Iran for a lot of reasons. Fine, go right ahead. Mm. But you can't deny the fact that it was involved in fighting ISIS and Al Qaeda. Yeah. I mean, and anyone makes that connection is just a fraud, absolute fraud. Mm. I mean, why why is Iran involved in Iraq? Because they're the Iraqis are, are very appreciative that mm. Iran's involvement in 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 fighting the caliphate that was mm. there only years ago. OK, and, and, and why do you think Assad wants to have uh, Iranian support mm -hmm. to fight terrorism? And, and, and Assad, more than anyone else in the world, knows what that mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. My goodness, that country has been so ravaged by these groups that, that are uh, uh, explicitly or implicitly supported by the West and, mm -hmm. and, and countries like Saudi Arabia. So, um, you know, the priorities are all wrong here. OK, most terrorism in, in the Middle East comes from one side, the, the Sunni side, not the Shia side. No. It's an uncomfortable I, truth, isn't it, Peter? I mean, but, but it's so and from, obvious. And for the that entire they, mainstream media. It, 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 it's really bewildering. Again, when we have this age of uh, social media and you can find things out and you still hear this, no, this absolute nonsense, these are fairy tales. Hannity says it like every Alexandra Hannity says it like every other minute. Mm. Iran, the number one spawn state sponsor of terrorism. Every 30 seconds. Yes. That narrative yeah. is true. But you out. know, but it's really interesting. There's a juxtaposition here. Um, would Hannity ever have Pat Buchanan on? No. Okay. Uh, but uh, he'll go uh, he'll go on with um uh, Laura Ingram or, and I think even Tucker at one point. Um, but you're right. I mean, that's why it's really interesting you mentioned Hannity because I was just thinking I'm not going to watch him tomorrow because I just don't want to hear all these, this nonsense. Hannity is great on Russiagate. I really appreciate his hard work on that. I really do. Uh, he should be saluted for it. But when it comes to these other issues, it just it's so worn out, so tiresome and so anti-intellectual and anti um, uh, um, uh, Theoretical. Um, it, these are just uh, talking points, and unfortunately, uh, that's what we're left with. Okay, and it, it, it's uh, across all the networks. It's just shades of that. Okay, it, it's not. It's not very nuanced, actually. Mm -hmm. 
No. I mean, one of the great problems in getting a, a, a coherent US foreign policy put together in the Middle East is that there is this visceral loathing in the United States of Iran on the part of so many people. I think Why? a lot of it... Why? Well, I think a lot of it goes the back... The hostage crisis. hostage crisis, I was going to say. I mean, it was interesting that even Donald Trump brought it up. I mean, he talked about how he had these 52 targets in oh, mind. That was an awful was tweet where he, where he mentioned oh, targeting... Cultural. cultural. Cultural targets, yeah. And, and, but, I mean, the 52 were apparently... He, he, he plucked out that number because there'd been 52 hostages at the U.S. Embassy in 1979. That seems to have become very hardwired for many, many Americans. And of course, there's also this idea that Iran is um, this uh, adversary of Israel, that we know many Americans have this very strong uh, uh, emotional commitment to Israel. And I think within the U.S. military and intelligence and security establishment, there's also very great resentment at uh, the way in which Iran successfully capitalized on the invasion, the US invasion of Iraq. I think a lot of people in Washington feel that America spent, you know, made a huge effort in Iraq, but that it was Iran that won and somehow it did so in a way that, you know, is. Yeah but, they, yeah, but they but they won through the failures of U.S. Well, policy exactly. makers. Well, exactly. I mean, they, again, they, exactly. they, they, they won more by default than anything exactly. else. They exactly. won by default by doing almost nothing or exactly. virtually nothing. Don't get me wrong. I looked at the, the uh, um, mm. Iraqi papers. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Iranians, yeah, they took advantage. They, you bet they <laughs> took advantage, okay? Um, um, and that's the fault of policymakers in Washington. Yes. And, and can one say, I mean, there's an awful lot, I mean, I'm not, when Peter said at the beginning that we are not, you know, a pro-Iranian channel, we're not. We are perfectly well aware of that there are many things about Iran that, you know, they do there. Uh, I mean, to give to give one very straightforward example, I mean, I, I do not accept the view that you sometimes hear people say that Iran is a democracy. Iran is an Islamic republic. It yep. is a very constrained political system. As somebody who you know believes in democracy, that is something that I'm you know I'm conscious of, and I am not you know supporting. I don't support the way is Iran uh, applies Islamic law. I mean you know they have the death penalty. I happen to be someone who doesn't like the death penalty. That's a very British point of view, by the way. But it is mine. So I'm not I'm not pro Iranian, and I'm not I'm also very conscious that the Iranians in their conduct of foreign policy can be very manipulative and very ruthless and they can be very successful. But that's what states do. But that's what, what states, states do. Are. Exactly. But where I will not go is in this accepting this picture that Iran is this, you know, massive monster, this huge, you know, focus of evil that is controlling terrorism everywhere. I, I, I get very concerned when I hear people talk like that about a country, especially a country like Iran, which is actually, when you follow it closely, it's diverse, it has an active politics, it has many people with different opinions. It's certainly not this, uh, you know, totalitarian monolith that it's made out to be. And in my opinion, I'm going to say this bluntly, I don't think it poses any kind of threat to the United States. I mean, I think the idea that Iran can seriously threaten the United States or indeed Israel is vastly overblown. And I don't think that's part of the Iranian agenda at all. I say that, you know, I, I follow Iran very, very closely. I have many criticisms to make of the country, but, you know, I, I just will not buy into this, you know, black and white picture of the country that so, so many people in the US want to make. And I think by adopting that picture, it's leading the United States into all sorts of mistakes. And if you want to go to the uh, news site, um, which I think both Peter and I read regularly, where all of this is discussed at great length, 
And in perhaps the most insightful way, it is the American conservative. Yeah. And they talk there regularly. And, you know, you get all kinds of very conservative people, all, you know, writing on that side about America's, you know, Iran obsession and Donald Trump's Iran obsession. Obsessions are never good things. They always lead you into... It's, it, uh, obsession is not a strategy. It's not a strategy, exactly. All right. And, and, and you know, in, uh, what is it? Iran spends less money on its defense than Canada does. Take that on board. Um, having, I agree with everything that Alexander McCure has just said, but we have to keep in mind, too, <clears throat> that Iran will do anything and everything to protect its existence. Yes. Don't underestimate that. Mm -hmm. OK, but they, they you have to remember they we are all talking about will there be possibly a war? Well, as far as the Iranians are concerned, at least their leadership, they are at war. Yeah, this is war yes. now. That's how they see it. This maximum pressure. That's that's war by a yeah. different name. Which is a maximum pressure policy, which is now consolidating Iranian feeling opinion not just behind the Iranian government, but against the United States. All you have to do is see all those pictures of all those people who turned out for Soleimani's funeral. I mean, first of all, uh, and there is polling, and it's done, in fact, by Western polling agencies in Iran. Uh, uh, the government there, for all the many criticisms one can make of it, does have legitimacy. Most Iranians do support it. I know this is something Americans don't want many Americans find difficult to understand. But remember how many Americans also thought, you know, that if they marched into Iraq in 2003, the Iraqi people would greet them with flowers as liberators. And it didn't turn out like that. I Iran is a different country from the United States. People do things differently there. And the government does enjoy a very great deal of support. It does also have, there are lots of people who oppose it in Iran also. That doesn't mean that they want the United States going into Iran, not to liberate them, as they would say, but to invade them. This kind of policy that we're seeing is convincing more and more Iranians that the United States is their enemy. And when they hear the president of the United States talking about, uh, you know, the United States attacking Iranian cultural sites. What are the Iranian people who have a very ancient culture of which they are extremely proud? And what does it have to do with the Islamic Republic? These, well, these, uh, well, indeed. I mean, you know, are you going to attack Persepolis? Persepolis, which was built by a pre-Islamic Iranian dynasty. Did, did ISIS, did ISIS not tear down? the cultural significance Palmyra. of Palmyra. Well, they did, absolutely. And they were blowing up artifacts which were thousands of years old. And wasn't the absolutely. world disgusted by that? Is, is that the policy? Cra cradle of civilization. Yeah, is yeah, that the policy that, that that tweet was putting forth? Uh, well, it's, just, it's mystifying. It, it, it really is, mystifying. is. I mean, again, I, 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 I'm going to be very, very indulgent to Trump. I'm going to say that those are terrible and awful tweets. But I don't think he really probably meant what he said there, but it was a terrible thing to say. And in Iran itself, as I said, people are going to be horrified by it. And, you know, you can be absolutely sure that every Iranian knows about it now, because, you know, that's the other thing I would say about Iran. Iranians are a politically very sophisticated. Sophisticated, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's really one of these interesting things. It, it shows how the American elites uh, uh, function in a bubble. Mm -hmm. um, when you let, like, let's just take Mike Pompeo going on uh, uh, all the political shows, and he's he, you know he's got his bombast and he's got his uh, um, uh, 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 his language, you know the, the the evil evil Iranians, the the Ayatollahs, they always like to say that. You know what happens is that they just put it on Iranian television and they say this is what they say about us. Yeah. They don't even have to filter it. They don't understand that this bombast is used as soft power to their own advantage. Okay, I, I know that for a fact because it, the same thing when, when uh, Russia is um, uh, unnecessarily 
uh, criticized. All they do is put it on the, the nightly broadcast and everyone says, oh, that's what they think of us. And they use it to, they use it to their advantage here. They don't understand how media works very well because they're only thinking about their own group think, their own bubble. They don't, they don't stop for a second to realize how an outside world interprets it. Well, Pompeo put up a tweet, Peter. Alexandria put up a tweet after the, the strike of like people in the streets of like 100 people celebrating the, the death of Soleimani. And he was like saying, look, they're happy. We, we liberated them from this terrorist. Yeah. It was just like, and, th and then you look at the, the video coming out from the funeral. And it was, I don't know, two, 300,000 people in the street yeah. during his funeral and just sit there and you say, what? Oh, they, they were all paid, right? They were yeah, all paid. What, I mean, what are you, gonna what are you doing? Those. Yes. Anyway, secular beast, what do you say? Not pro-Iranian, but... Russia, because Russia has their fingers in Iran. Yes. How? How? <laughs> How? In what way? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, they, I, I don't even, Alexander McKears, maybe you can remember this. What was the, uh, the Bashir nuclear plant that yeah, Russia sure. took, so they took over from the Germans? And um, it, it all came to a standstill because um, of a payment, mm -hmm. uh, um, a br breakdown on how to pay. And, I mean, if, if, if Russia has so much sway, why didn't they just de make demands? Or mm. um, um, Russia, oh, um, I think at one point, requested the use of an airfield because it, to back up its support in, in Syria. And I think for a very short amount of time, the Iranians agreed. And then they said, no, 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 no. We don't have foreigners on our soil. We don't have foreign military on our mm. soil. It's a sovereignty issue. Sorry. So I don't know where this comes from. I, I'm mystified by it. Well, I need I need facts. Okay. Well, no, Russia opinion. did it. Russia did it, Peter. Just accept it. Russia's <laughs> behind the whole thing. Nope. That's <laughs> why we. I, I I don't accept that. That's why we do these podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 it's just. I mean, I think what it is is a lot of people see Russia as an adversary of the U.S. Russia has no desire to be an adversary of the U.S. And they see Iran as an adversary of the U U.S. So they lump these two adversaries together and because Russia is the stronger power, it's assumed to be controlling Iran. That is not a, that's not even a chain of deduction. That's a chain of prejudice, frankly. It is not based on any facts. Peter has set out the facts. I mean, I remember the Boucher uh, uh, debacle, this, uh, this, this nuclear power plant that the Russians were supposed to sort out in Iran, which took forever to sort out because there were problems with the funding and there were disagreements about how it was supposed to be. Well, and what currency they were gonna pay for well, it exactly. in and things like that. Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, and you know, you meet lots of people in Iran, lots of officials within the Iranian government, I mean, you know, who are not particularly pro, in fact, they're not, not only not particularly pro-Russian, some of them have been anti-Russian. As Peter said, you know, this is the little Satan. I mean, the US was the great Satan. Russia was the little Satan. For many people in Iran, the idea that the Russians are in control of Iran is nonsensical. But yeah, I, 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 re I can remember very, very clearly. It was um, in the early years of, um, of Crosstalk, and we had an yes. uh, Iranian-American woman in Los Angeles who remained nameless, a uh, very nice person. And um, she said, well, why is Russia backing uh, the United Nations Security Council uh, with uh, sanctions against uh, Iran? And I said, well, Russia is anti-proliferation and they see this as an issue. OK, yeah. it's, don't take it personally. OK, it's a it's a it's a policy uh, yeah. imperative for them. It's in, you know, well, why aren't you some why isn't Russia doing more to support Iran? And I said, Russia's foreign policy is serves its interests. OK. That, that's one of the reasons why the Soviet Union fell apart because it wasn't serving its own interests; no. it was serving the interests of others. Okay, yes. and Russia is very, very, very clear that it's going to protect its sovereignty and will do what is good for it. Okay, not make any special favors. Yes. It doesn't work that way. Yes, but uh, and Peter was absolutely right. The country that's going to win out of all of this is China because, of course, every one of these wars that the United States has fought in the Middle East have distracted the U.S from the fact that China is growing in power all the time. And you know, do you really want to be bogged down in the desert? What, it, you know, it, it, what, makes it, what, what, what makes it worse in a way, I guess if you're if sitting yeah. in, in Beijing, is that 
Yeah. At some point in time, there's going to have to be a reckoning where we yeah. have the, Thuc the Thucydides trap is, is in play right now. And, you know, it, one element of the Thucydides trap is that you have to negotiate. From Beijing, Beijing's perspective, can you actually negotiate with these people? Uh, it, 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 are, are they a rational partner to deal with? And, that, and that, that's a serious uh, question to be raised here. Because even if you wanted to make an agreement, will bo both sides be able to keep it? You know, walking away from the, 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 uh, the uh, Iran Iranian nuclear deal sends a message around the world that, okay, this pres one president will sign it, but another one will tear it up. Then why make an agreement in, at all? And this, mm. th this has implications. Mm. Mm. We saw it in North Korea. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Straight away, we saw it in North Korea. Mm. Yep. Mm. From Sparky, Super Chat, Pompeo and Haspel misled President Trump once again. Trump really stepped on it. He has to own it. They also convinced him to be apathetic about Assange. Well, yes. Sparky, Sparky always has great comments. What, what do you guys think of that? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I spot on. I mean, I, I, I personally think this is, I mean, I, this is exactly my own opinion. I think that Trump as I said, was, was on holiday. He was not, uh, he's not particularly well informed about, you know, the granular events in, in the Middle East. And why should he be? I mean, you know, that's not that's what he's got advisors for. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And as I said, he's, he's advisors who have completely different agendas. And, you know, all these people who came flocking around him, you know, Rubio, Graham, Cruz, all the others. Kushner. You know, they manipulated him. And I think he's now uh, uh, understands this. I mean, there's a there was a very interesting report, by the way, from the Iranians. I don't know whether it's true and it may not be true that the Iranians actually received through the Swiss, through Swiss, a, a, a letter. I heard this, too. Yeah. In which the, the, the U.S. apparently uh, uh, or at least someone in the U.S. was telling them, please don't overreact to this. We're, you know, we're looking for, we're also now, you know, uh, trying to understand, to calm things down, which would suggest that someone, perhaps Trump, if it's true, if that story is true, that someone, perhaps Trump, understands that the US did cross red lines when they murdered uh, um, Soleimani. I use the word murder advisedly, by the way. Murdered Soleimani whilst he was conducting a diplomatic mission on behalf of his government in, 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 in contact with two other governments, uh, one of which, both of which, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, are allies of the United States. So I think maybe there are people in Washington who've now you know, understood that this, was, that this was absolutely, completely and disastrously the wrong thing to do and are trying to sort of you know, calm things down. And I'm fully willing to believe that Donald Trump in spite of all his public bluster, is one of those people. Okay, from Sparky, Trump supporters need to send a message by voting for Tulsi Gabbard in the primary. Many, if not most states have open primaries. Well, yes. well I don't I, I, I'm not gonna suggest how people should vote, but um, uh, Tulsi Gabbard's uh, currency just was increased, yeah. okay? I mean, she voted present, Remember in Congress during the impeachment and articles, uh, she scored a lot of points with that. I don't know what Tulsi's saying about this, um, mm. uh, um, but I wouldn't be surprised that she's going to try to make political gain out of it. She's a politician, after all, running for president. Yes, I think her first reaction, if I'm not mistaken, Peter, was that she came out against it. She she was not supportive of it, but I think that was her first reaction. But yes. I, I don't know what she said recently. Mm. From Flying Borg. This tells Trump is not immune to criticism, unlike Putin, who can take it. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see where this goes here. I mean, we're speculating and we're only speculating yes. here. Yes. We're only speculating. I, I, I tend to think that he may, that Trump may be having some second thoughts about this. I don't know that for no. a fact, but looking at his uh, 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 approach to the press kind of was different than usual. Um, and um, this note that was sent, if it was sent through the Swiss, would say that there, someone's having second thoughts or wants clarity. Well, good thing is maybe they want to have some communication. I mean, my goodness, after this, uh, it would be 
very, very difficult for the Iranian leadership to reach out now. I mean, it, it, at this point in time, it's just simply impossible. Yeah. And this is what people around Trump want. They want to close doors. They can't go back. Exactly. And that is what the, a good leader, a good politician, what does he or she always have? Options. Yes. Options. And this, this takes away almost all options here. Mm -hmm. And the only one, you can only go in one direction. That's not leadership. That's well not said. good politics. No. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Very simple. Well said, Peter. Options. Yeah. Soren Bisgard, I believe that's 5,000 yen, I believe. Thank you for that super chat. I'm not sure how much 5,000 yen is, but... Looks nice. Moon Dragon, <laughs> SEC, we like, we like a lot of zeros, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but thank you for that super chat. We appreciate it. From Moon Dragon, SEK, 50, U.S. fights against Iran, but by every move, they made it stronger in the region ever since the removal of Saddam. What's Absolutely. your take? Absolutely true. Yes. Absolutely true. Look, look at this. Let, let's take Syria, for example. Before this international proxy war against the, the Damascus government, what kind of relationship did Syria have with Iran? Friendly, okay. But the, it, it wasn't much deeper than that, mm. okay. They had a common cause against a common enemy, all right. But now they are closer now than you could have ever imagined back in, two, let's say, like 2013, all right. Why? It's because of the missteps of Western countries in the Middle East. All they do is empower Iran every step of the way. All they have to do is wait for the, for the, uh, the policy to fail, because you know what? It will. I mean, that's at least, if you look at precedent, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. This is going to be a failed gambit. They mm -hmm. only make Iran stronger in the region. Look, I mean, the Saudis quietly are, appear to be, well, we don't know well, no, now, but reaching out to, to Iran. Oh, we know that um, uh, Qatar is doing the same thing. Um, they realize that the West, the West presence in the Middle East is a dead end, and they have to start taking uh, the reins themselves and start making decisions, as difficult as they may be. They mm -hmm. should be encouraged, not uh, discouraged like this murder was. This is, that's, this is a discouragement, obviously. Mm -hmm. All right, from Global Citizen, five euro super chat. If Russia and China steps in to avoid war, what can they do? What options do they have? They can talk to people. Uh, I mean, they can talk to the Iranians and they can talk to the Iraqis and they can talk to the Saudis and they can talk to the Turks and they can talk to the Americans. And uh, the Israelis. And the Israelis. They can talk to all of these people and they can try and say, look, to every one of them, look, this isn't in your interests. A shooting war in the, in the Gulf. Uh, is, is full, filled with unpredictable consequences. There are uh, uh, lots of your people, um, um, you know, who will uh, uh, suffer horribly if this go if this war um, escalates. That includes, by the way, Americans and Britons and all kinds of people who are in the Middle East. So let us try and find a way out and a way back towards negotiations. And that's what they can do. And I think um, there are people who are going to be receptive to this. I mean, the Russians handled Turkey very well in relation to the Syrian conflict. And that's a handful. And, it, and that was a handful. And I think Saudi Arabia actually is in some ways an easier uh, um, nut for the Amer Russians to crack because the Russians have more leverage over Saudi Arabia over the oil supply issues. So, you know, they will be working on all of this and they will be persuading people, look, if you want, our, if you want peace, if you want stability, if you want us as your friends, then you will listen to what we say and you will follow through with the compromises which we suggest. Can I just go back to that comment that that very astute uh, 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 viewer said, you know, about how all of these American actions ended up making Iran regionally stronger. Of course, if the Iraqi government now pushes ahead with this policy of having all US forces leave Iraq. And that, by the way, is the official policy now of the Iraqi government. The Iraqi parliament, its resolution is not legally binding, but the Iraqi prime minister 
is commit, you know, has, has publicly committed himself to it. If that is what happens, then Iraq, sorry, then Iran becomes even stronger, which would be a great paradox, a paradox. After all the money, after all the resources, exactly. after all exactly. the lives. Yes. Now, it may surprise some of our viewers if I say that I don't think that the Russians want that outcome. I, I, the Russians always look to maintain balances of power between various adversaries. So I think that they will not want to see Iran become overly strong in this region, which might in itself create various instabilities. So they will try to, be, to find ways to balance any rise of Iranian power with you know, analogous positions of other countries. So Russian diplomacy will certainly be in action uh, uh, and they will try and find ways through. And, you know, I think if people listen to them. And I think I think that the, the Iranians will listen to the Chinese the because, the, Chi the, because the Chinese. The, the, the problem the, is now is not there. The problem is with the neocons in Washington. It always has been. Yep. All right. Soren says that 5,000 yen is 50 USD, guys. So thank well, you, you Soren, for that very much. Thank you very much for that super chat. From Sparky, Trump can't make up this error, but can mitigate it slightly by kicking Pompeo, Haspel, and their ilk out of their asses ASAP. You guys just said it, the neocons are the problem. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Sparky's super chat, his comment? Yes. You know, it, it would ha have to be a... a, a uh, a political move of such sophistication to be able to uh, reverse what has been set into play. It'd be yes. very, very difficult yes. to do that. Yes. Um, and you, we, we already know that the deep state has done so much damage to this president and uh, presidency. Yes. Um, and then they will just go on steroids. They do not want a reversal of this. They want, they're all in, they're all in. As I said earlier, there's no downside for them. The only downside is for Donald Trump. Yes. Three years running and Trump has not gotten into a war. My take is, I, I agree with you, Peter, my take is they want their war before the first term is over. Mm. Every president gets into a war, according to these guys' heads. They want Trump to get into a war in the mm. US. They're not gonna let it go until he gets into a war. That's my take on these, yeah, on what's but, going on. But unlike all the other wars, Iran will defend itself. It will really, really, inflict a lot of pain on the region and American allies and assets. Um, they have nothing to lose then. And again, where are the options here? This is the nightmare that's being constructed. There, you can't find a way out. And, and I think, you know, right now, as we speak right now, maybe something will change, but you know, Trump has just painted himself into a corner. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be really hard yeah. to, to, kind of, to, to, to change uh, direction on this. Yeah. And we and we know him. He doubles down when he gets when he gets in, when he gets defensive. He gets he double he doubles down. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I will say though is that is Trump does have a remarkable skill for getting himself out of a corner. I mean, he he does find ways ultimately to move on. Um, whether he will this time is another thing. It does. This is, by the way, with where. where the Iranians are very important, what the Russians say to the Iranians and what the Iranians do. If the Iranians are goaded into an you know, open attack on American facilities, then as I said, it, 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 all bets are off. Yeah. And, then, and then Trump is in very, you know. Alexander, what about a false flag? And I heard yeah, Graham, I think he was on, on Sunday Morning Futures and Graham said it outright. He says, if something happens, we will attack Iran's yeah. oil fields and oil reserves. He said it yeah. outright. Yeah. He said that's the next step. So what about a false flag? That's that's well, the part absolutely. that worries I me. Mean, that, and the false that, flag that, could come from that, anywhere. But that's from how Saudi we Arabia, from Israel, from That's how we anywhere. started this conversation, that yeah. have, working with the assumption that Iran controls all of these assets yeah. monolithically is wrong. And that creates the opportunity for a false flag someone that wants this conflict, a conflict that Iran doesn't want, yes. and maybe ultimately the US doesn't want, at least yeah. Trump doesn't want. Yes. Yeah, it would, but having this monolithic view is the most dangerous situation that we have. A, 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 a convoy is attacked. Is that a cause to, to go to war? 
Uh, I hope not. That have, it would have be the painted neocons that checkmated way. Trump, guys? Yes. Have the neocons checkmated him with regards to Iran? Have they checkmated him? Yeah, I, well, I, can't, I don't see a way out. OK, it, 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 yes, I would say yes, because I, I don't see a way out for, for Trump right now. I think he needs to be, um, I don't think he is completely checkmated, but I think he needs to be much, much more careful in future about what he's led into. I I'm hoping that behind all the bluster that we've seen over the last few days, he's learned an important lesson, which is that you've got to abide by red lines, not just your own, but by other people's. Otherwise, you could find yourself into all kinds of situations. So it's all very well for Lindsey Graham to say that if anything happens in the Middle East, we attack Iran's oil facilities. But the decision is Donald Trump's. It's not Lindsey Graham's at the end of the day. It's Donald Trump who is the president of the United yeah. States. Yeah. OK, well, Lindsey Graham, let me tell you this. Mm. Um, uh, you did a great job with Kavanaugh. No mm. problem. But, you know, your statement is silly and stupid. Mm. So you want to the U.S. will destroy Iran's uh, oil facilities and, and attack its oil fields. What do you think Iran's going to do to Saudi Arabia's? Mm. Huh? in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. Look, a group of uh, uh, Houthis, apparently, um, uh, in one of the poorest countries in the world, attack Saudi um, uh, energy and uh, uh, assets with devastating effect. Now, what do you think a sovereign state like Iran that has this kind of technology, what do you think they're going to do to Saudi in other Arab uh, oil facilities across the region. What do you think they're going to do? And what is gonna to happen to the global economy? Mr. Trump, okay, what's gonna to happen to your wonderful economy? See, this is the nightmare situation. Yeah. You know, and it's always a weird election. We, 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 and William, we'll, we'll, we'll attack Iran. These people don't, haven't sat down and thought about it, um, the implications of that, because Iran will fight back ferociously yes from 737 tech ten dollar super chat thank you very much 737 tech from brave new perth will turkey leave nato i still don't believe it i don't quite believe it they, they uh, they'll use it as leverage no yeah, and erdogan is it. he's always in the bazaar he's always in the bazaar he's going to that's something he clutches onto and he uses it to his advantage. And you know what? He, as a NATO member, he gets away with it, with the things with impunity. There's nothing yeah. much the other members can do, but they don't want to lose Turkey. Yeah. He knows that because the, the, the alliance needs Turkey more than Turkey needs the alliance. That's mm. for damn sure. Oh, absolutely. From Sparky, a $5 super chat. As far as making, as far as, as far as efforting to make up this, Era, maybe Donald Trump can change his tune and finally, egregious era, maybe Donald Trump can change his tune and finally try to help Julian Assange. Well, I don't think the one will, will solve the other problem, but I do think Donald Trump should help Julian Assange. He isn't going to, though. Going I mean, to. his own Justice Department is seeking to extradite Julian Assange. So we must be realistic. That's not going to happen. And even if it did, it would only land, I think, Donald Trump in a host of more political troubles. Oh, yeah. And it would not yeah. solve his problems yeah. with, Iran, with Iran. Because, because the, the, yeah. the, the public perception is, and this is what the media has done, yeah. and the political elites, remember, WikiLeaks is run by the Russians. Okay? You see what I mean? Yeah, it's it's hopeless. It's hopeless. And we support Assange, and therefore yeah, we're yeah, run blah, by the Russia. It, it, yeah, it yeah, never yeah. ends. It would never end. Yeah, never ends. Yes. From Mikhail Flyer, a two pound super chat has Trump shot himself in the head. That goes with if he's been checkmated. I guess okay, it's the same. Well, he well, certainly shot himself in the foot. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that as yeah. far as that. Mm -hmm. Thank well, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was a terrible mistake, as as we've uh, been discussing on this program. It doesn't help Donald Trump at all. I think he knows it. I think uh, deep down, he's aware of that. He's aware of it. And um, well, we'll see what he does now. Mm -hmm. All right, from Flying Boar, five dollar, five Canadian dollar super chat. Trump threatened to strike fifty two sites in Iran, including cultural sites, yeah. if Iran retaliated. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I'm left I'm speechless, speechless with yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I've, I can't okay, believe you said that out. We have to wrap it up pretty yep. soon. My dogs are getting really yep, rested. We have a few more super chats and okay. we'll wrap it up. From Sparky, not a silver lining, but hopefully Trump now knows a few more enemies from within. Wouldn't hurt him to brush up on Cicero. <laughs> you know, the thing, the, I think from, from the very first, I don't know what, this is 50, the 51st uh, uh, podcast we've done uh, together. I mean, I think uh, Alex, you and I have commented almost on every single one of them that Trump just has a huge HR problem. You know, just yeah. that, that that's really a blind spot uh, that, to Iran and a huge yeah. HR problem. Yeah. And, and having Jared Kushner in the family doesn't help. No. On that, that's for sure. From Valley S, a twenty dollars super chat. Thank you, Valley S, for that super chat. We always appreciate it. From Flying Boar, if I am King Jong Un in North Korea, I should have second thoughts on making deals with the U.S. on nukes. I think he is. Yeah, well, I think that's obvious. I mean, I mean, I mean, you had John Bolton, you know, say, "Well, there's the uh, the Libya, uh, Libya precedent," which, of course, he was saying, you know, uh, Gaddafi disarmed. But you know, from if you're in North Korea, it's a, but you killed Gaddafi. <laughs> that, that, that's the precedent you said. Okay, again, you know, it, it gets down to can you uh, come to an agreement with the uh, person across the table? And uh, we have another example here where that's not that's a dicey proposition. Yeah. I mean, Alexander McKeer is quite eloquently. And in the very beginning uh, of our podcast today, it explained um, the legalities of dealing with um, uh, diplomatic initiatives. Okay, what what happens if, if, if like, let's use North Korea? They send an envoy, and they, the envoy gets killed at LAX. Okay, I mean the, the person doesn't have any kind of diplomatic immunity. I mean, it just defies logic. Okay, yeah. and and and. Uh, the North Korean leadership uh, draws the correct conclusion. Yeah. You can't make an agreement. From Robin Adams, 22 Australian dollars super chat. Thanks, Duran. Thank you, Robin, for that super chat. From Sparky, DOJ hasn't cared about the rule of American law in years. So it's no surprise that American officials don't care about the rule of international law. Well, I, I think many of American officials don't believe in international law. John Bolton never did. He never made any pretense about it. Yep. All right, from Emil, uh, $50, 50 SEK Super Chat. Just saying good job. Thank you, Emil, for that Super Chat very much. From Sparky, I wonder if Trump's developed Stockholm Syndrome. Hmm. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah, it's just, it's speechless. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, I, speechless. I, you know, the, thing, the thing is, is that, you know, I may have to be reading this wrong, but he what he likes to do best is what he's best at, campaigning. Yeah, and I think the, he probably think what? what I, I, you know, everybody's talking about something else right now. Why? I'm I'm running for re-election. Yeah. Okay, and and of course it's going to be used for in a variety of reasons. I mean, the the, the Democrats are using the procedural thing, which is you know so spineless. Okay, mm -hmm. um, uh, does anybody you know what uh, Rand Paul has said? I I haven't heard. Is he? Mm -hmm. He, he, he came out his first his first comments were also that, that mm -hmm. I believe Trump he, he was like Trump has boxed himself in. Mm -hmm. I think the, the mainstream media Fox News was extremely upset because all the Republican senators were pretty much all in unison supporting what Trump did except for Rand Paul they said it except for Rand Paul so that was his take. And then look at that Stockholm syndrome geez. Yeah. All right from Colin Foster so North Korea is vindicated having its nukes question mark. Well, lots of people in North Korea will say that. I mean, the North Koreans made that very point, by the way, after um, uh, Gaddafi was killed, that uh, Libya made a huge mistake giving up its uh, uh, nuclear weapons program. Of course, Libya didn't actually have any real nuclear weapons program to give up. But the North Koreans have looked at this. They've looked at what happened to Syria. They've looked at what happened to Iraq, they're now looking at what's happened to Iran, and they say, why should we give up on nuclear weapons? It's uh, only going to expose us to this kind of attack. They had chemical and biomedical weapons though, didn't they, Alexander, Gaddafi? Well, he did have, but I mean, he never, he was never able to use them because it's clear nuclear weapons are the really dangerous ones. Okay. From GEC Super Chat, not intended, not unintended consequences, but intended consequences. Let's face it, Israel bought oil from ISIS, Syria, and the US allowed it, but prevents Syria from doing the same. 
well, pr prevents Syria from buying oil from Iran, I presume, is because, of course, as far as I know, Syria has never bought oil from ISIS. But there's no conceivable way that uh, 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 the U.S. Um, is going to allow, um, well, it, it can prevent, sorry, can prevent Syria obtaining oil from... Well, they stopped uh, tankers, the U.K., didn't it? I mean... Sorry? Did the UK stop tankers? That oh, it stopped tankers, to? but they eventually went there. They eventually right. arrived in Syria. But ultimately, what would happen? Let, let's say there was a sea blockade of Syria. Um, what would happen is that the Russians would send the oil and the Iranians would replace it. So, I mean, it, yeah. the Iranian oil would go to Russia and the Russians would send oil to Iran and that's how it, to, to Syria. And that's how it would work. You can't control these things. It, you can it's, just, re, just reflagging. Okay. Yeah, exactly, reflagging. It, it, it's, it's impossible to stop these things in the way that some people in the US seem to think it is. It just doesn't work like that. Okay, from Harry Smith, Iran could close Hormuz in less than a day and crash global economy overnight. Kind of hope they do, actually. What do you guys think is the likely, the likelihood timescale for this happening? I think Iran will play that. I mean, that, that is for Iran the ultimate you know, big event. I, I think the Iranians would prefer not to go that far because it's the kind of thing that if, it, if they do that, it will provoke a very strong American reaction. And that would lead, I think, to directly to something. Yeah, but the, cl the, the closing of the straits would be a reaction to something that the yes, United States absolutely. and its allies were doing. I, I think we're some way from that point. I, that's, I the, think, that's their last card, not their exactly. first card. Exactly. I, I think we're some way from that, yeah. And from, I hope we don't get that, but we'll see. From Kit Wilson, Zayo Israel gain in the U.S. Middle East wars. Russia and Israel are friends. Well, you see, this is interesting because people bring up Israel. I... I Israel has made this, has convinced itself, or at least it says it you know, to everybody, that Iran is this great existential threat to Israel. Um, all I will say is that all these wars that have been fought in the Middle East over the last 20 years, I don't see how they worked to Israel's advantage at all. Agreed, agreed. agreed. I mean, the, the, what, Iraq such as it is, is now, you know, closer to Iran. Syria is closer to Iran, as uh, 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 Peter said. Uh, and Lebanon, uh, Lebanon is, okay, Lebanon, after that. After the, where did, where, where, where did uh, Hezbollah come from? More it came from, as a reaction to uh, Israel's illegal two-decade occupation of southern Lebanon. Exactly. Okay, how did that benefit? Okay, um, and <clears throat> tried to divide the, um, the PLO. OK, by creating a, a, an Islamic faction to to yes. compete with it. And that became Hamas. Yes. OK, they, they all fail. Yes. OK, all this meddling works against you at the end of the day. At the end of the day, so, I mean, Israel is very secure within its own territories. But in fact, if you actually look at the overall geopolitical picture, it, 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 it's turning against Israel and what they now have in Syria is a Syria which used to have a shambolic military because the Syrian military, like most Arab militaries, you know, before the, the Syrian war was a creaking, broken thing. Corrupt. Uh, corrupt, all those things. Now it's actually an effective military with advanced weapons, which it knows how to use. So, you know, the balance is shifting against... Israel. I would have said, you know, the right policy for Israel at this time is not to seek more wars in the Middle East, but to try and work towards some kind of peace in the Middle East, which will include itself, and that must mean including the Palestinians also. I continue to believe that is achievable, but the window, the window for that is closing. Okay, from Gloria, $10 Super Chat. I love your discussions. Thank you, Gloria. From Edward, one more nail in the coffin of American influence. Super Chat. Thank you, Edward, for that Super Chat. From Imre Kalman, I agree with everything Alexander says. Where have I heard that before? With a oh. wink. Thank you very much, Imre, for that Super Chat. From Magnesia Shan, do you think Nigel Farage will still campaign for Trump? Super Chat. 
Nigel Farage campaigning for Trump? Yes or no? I don't know. I mean, he is. I I don't think that this is a big issue for him. Actually, I mean, Nigel Farage's whole career has been focused around one big issue, which is getting Britain out of the European Union. He has exceed. He has achieved this beyond, I think, even his own expectations. He clearly gets on with Donald Trump. I don't think he's going to allow this issue to get it get in the way yeah, yeah I, I, I have to also say this if we do well, we're going to leave the european union on the 31st of january i think if at the end of uh, at the end of this year we have uh, the 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 brexit that boris johnson is talking about then extraordinarily but uh, uh, nigel farage's career will be done it'll be over he, yeah he will be able to leave the battle uh, having achieved what he set out to achieve. And I think that he's made it fairly clear that he doesn't want to be in politics indefinitely. Okay, so from, I think that's probably what we want to see. From Acid Jazz, thank you very much again for the super chat. I always enjoy it. Thank you, Acid Jazz. From Flying Boar, if I'm Assad in Damascus watching this, what he might be thinking, question mark. Bashar al-Assad is indeed watching this. He's watching the situation extremely closely. And of that, we can be absolutely sure. And Peter's absolutely right. He touched upon this, uh, upon this at an earlier uh, uh, point in this program. He will be very concerned if uh, American troops who are now in Iraq are transferred to Syria. He will be very worried about that. He will be very worried about a general war in the Middle East between Iran and the United States. That doesn't really work in his interests either. At the same time, if the, Iran if the Iraqis do insist on all US troops leaving Iraq and are able to make that stick, make that real, then of course, Syria's position becomes stronger because the American troops yeah. in Eastern Syria their position becomes untenable and they will have to go. So Assad is watching all this very carefully, but he's keeping, he's, uh, he's saying very little because of course his interests are to say very little. Obviously he supports Iran and he's obviously made, making that clear, but he, 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 his game at the moment is to watch and wait. Okay, from Robert Carr, the crowds for the general's mourning is massive, Iranian parliament chanting death to America. It's not looking good. Well, as I said, huge crowds, passionate feelings in Iran. I, 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 you know, the Iranians are, are a uh, passionate people, but they're also a calculating people. And I, I think that Iran will judge its decisions very carefully. I mean, I, I, again, both Peter and I have followed Iranians, Iranian politics, I think more closely than many people do. And the thing that really comes across, at least to me, is how sophisticated and calculating Iran's leaders are. Men like Khamenei, Rouhani, Zarif, Larijani, they are, they are very intelligent people. They weigh their decisions extremely carefully. They don't rush into things. Okay, let's get to the final super chats from Flying Boar. Update on Idlib, Syria. Well, um, we at the moment, this, I actually. mean, as we know, uh, uh, the the Syrian army has been advancing there. There's been all sorts of talk about hundreds of thousands of people fleeing Idlib. By the way, I don't believe that. I think that's wildly exaggerated, as it always is whenever we hear about these humanitarian <laughs> escapes. I think most people in Id Idlib, I get to say this bluntly, will be... Uh, uh, very relieved if the Syrian army comes and liberates them from the jih jihadis in their midst. That's been consistent pattern across uh, Syria. But as I said, I, I think the Idlib operation proceeds incrementally. More and more territories in Idlib are being are, are being freed from jihadi uh, control. Uh, there's this town that has apparently been surrounded by the Syrian army. I expect that before very long it will be liberated also. That's my own view. There will be, no doubt, attempts at chemical weapons, false flags. Oh, well, yeah, we are, yeah. But I, I think that even the Turks, uh, even Erdogan understands that this is an untenable thing. And I think that's coming to its end. Okay, from Toilet Sauce, will all seas have to pay a penalty for not completing Nord Stream 2? 
Well, the Russians are talking about legal action. Um, I think I think the company does actually have a legal defense under the uh, 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 under the doctrine of force majeure that they were pushed into this that they had no real choice but in effect to break their contract we will see i mean from the russian point of view their priority is not to punish a swiss company it's to complete Nord Stream 2, which they are perfectly able to do i, I read somewhere i mean some bizarre claims that the Russians aren't able to complete Nord Stream. Oh, nonsense. Uh, what do the Russians do best? They build pipelines. pipelines. They just build pipelines. Look, the, the, the thing is, is that they, the what Gazprom wanted to do is they wanted to have a consortium. They wanted, yeah. to, they wanted to spread out the risk and to spread out the benefits as well. Yeah. That's called doing good business. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they can do it all by themselves. Of so, of course fine, fine. And because, and they, people, so much has been written about Nord Stream. These people do not have any idea what they're talking about. Exactly. I mean, the Russians have, have the ships to do it. They have the pipe laying ships to do it. They have the technology to do it. They have the expertise to do it. They can do it better than the Swedish. <laughs> quite lots of better. Okay, the final two super chats. Peter's dogs are, are itchy to go out. Let's yeah. see. From, yeah, this is the final two is from Flying Boar. Is Trump trying to cool this one? by having a secret back channel with Putin on this Iran debacle. Again, that door is closed, okay? I yeah. mean, it, you know, I, I remember the, um, uh, um, Cenk Uger was on uh, with um, 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 Aaron Maté and um, uh, Cenk was saying, you know, well, you know, uh, when Trump, last time Trump spoke with, with Putin, he took uh, the translator's notes away and ripped them up and all of that. I mean. If you if you talk to Vladimir Putin about anything, you're, you you yeah. just re resurrect the, the the ridiculous three years that we've had here. Uh, I it would uh, it would be a good idea. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Russian Foreign Ministry is trying to you know find somebody they can talk rationally to about what's going on in the Middle East because it's pretty dangerous right now. I mean, at a time when people should be talking, people are discouraged to talk. That see, this is the poverty of the situation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. From Indigo Jones, late to the show, but what if Trump accepts Iraq's invitation to leave and keeps this campaign promise? Well, that would be very good for the United States. It would also yeah. be very good for Donald Trump. That's my own personal Yeah, opinion. Yeah, and, then media's, and the, me, in the media's reaction is that he's doing it because Putin told him to do exactly. it. See, we're in this ridiculous environment. It's exactly. so stupid. Final exactly. super chat from Flying Boar update on Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream. We talked about Nord Stream 2, talked. Turk Stream. Any news on... Well, uh, Putin we'll is going out. to Turkey. Yeah, Putin to open it up. In two days to uh, inaugurate the opening of Nord Stream 2. And as I said, Gazprom has made it very clear that they're now going to finish Nord Stream. Sorry, uh, the, Putin's Turk going Street. to Turkey, Turk Stream. But, uh, uh, and Gazprom have made it very clear that they will open uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, themselves very shortly. By the way, I mean, you know... There's also, I mean, it's not widely known, there is a massive liquefied natural gas facility being created by Russia in the Arctic Circle. And Russia now exports more liquefied natural gas to Europe than the US does. In fact, it's, it's, it's winning on every front in terms of gas. It's, it's got Turk Stream, it's almost got Nord Stream 2, and it will this year. And it made an agreement with, the, with Ukraine. Exactly. The last second agreement with Ukraine, and uh, incidentally, uh, uh, just to clarify, because it was a point that several comment uh, comments were made about it on an earlier video, uh, the Russians did uh, halve the tariff payments they're going to pay to Ukraine. Instead of fifteen billion, it'll be seven. So. As I said, they, they got a good deal out of Ukraine too. So they, they, they're winning. And, they, and of course, they built their giant pipeline to China. And they, they, they're winning on every front in the energy war. And um, if there's more trouble in the Middle East because the uh, uh, there's a war there, well, that will make. Who benefits? Russia, Russia benefits, at least its energy sector. Does. It is its energy sector. That is to make. That's not to say, by the way, that the Russians would welcome a war no, of course in not. the Middle East. The prospect of such a war horrifies them. Absolutely. They do not like instability anywhere. But the Middle East is a very, very, very sensitive area for them. They want to see peace there. 
and they want and in terms of controlling oil uh, prices the way they do that is by negotiating uh, let's be brunt about it cartel arrangements with the saudis and even the iranians if it comes to that they do not want to see war in the middle Okay, Soren, thank you for that 2,000 yen. Super Chat and Michael for your final Super Chat. NATO has never been weaker. Thank you for that as well. We agree with that. Agreed. Agree with that. Never been weaker. All right, Alexander, Peter, any final words or comments? I'm not going to ask you what you guys are looking at. Uh, yeah, I'm going to keep it. I think, well, I think we I, know what we're watching. I go, back, I go back to the studio on Thursday, so I think I'll be talking more about this. So I'm, Well, know, I... I think no, it'll, it'll be on, it'll be on air Friday. So. I think I think I think the big thing to look at next actually is Putin's visit to Turkey, because it's inevitable that he's going to be asked questions yeah. about the, the crisis, and that will give us a, a a clearer picture of what the Russians are doing and thinking at, at this moment in time. And I'm afraid um, this isn't a sort of a pro-Russian statement. Again, it's a question of fact. It's the Russians who are the big diplomats in this region and who act to broker all the various uh, compromises. And the people they talk to now in the United States, it's not Donald Trump, because whenever they talk to him, it's a disaster. They can't really talk to Pompeo. The Russians talk to the US military. There are long established connections now going in both in Syria and um, as a result of negotiations that took place between General Dunford, when he was uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and General Gerasimov, the chairman of the Russian General Staff. It's, it's, the two, it's through the militaries that the Russians and the US communicate with each other. And I'm sure that those communications are at the moment active. Okay. Alexander Mercurius in London, Peter Lavelle in Moscow. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who tuned into this live stream. We hope you have a really good week ahead and we'll be watching this story carefully as I'm sure everyone in this chat will also be keeping their eye on this story. All right, guys, have a great week ahead. Take care, everybody.